Chapter 36 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. A Stormy Night's Tragedy. Footnote. Fukuga told me this story and vouches for its accuracy. End of footnote. All who have read anything of Japanese history must have heard of Saigo Takamori, who lived between the years 1827 and 1877. He was a great imperialist, fighting for the emperor until 1876, when he gave over, owing to his disapproval of the Europeanization going on in the country and the abandonment of ancient national ways. As practical commander-in-chief of the imperial army, Saigo fled to Kagoshima, where he raised a body of faithful followers, which was the beginning of the Satsuma Rebellion. The imperialists defeated them, and in September of 1877, Saigo was killed, some say in the last battle, and others that he did seppuku, and that his head was cut off and secretly buried, so that it should not fall into the hands of his enemies. Saigo Takamori was highly honored even by the imperialists. It is hard to call him a rebel. He did not rebel against his emperor, but only against the revolting idea of becoming Europeanized. Who can say that he was not right? He was a man of fine sentiment and great loyalty. Should all of us follow meekly the imperial order in England if we were told that we were to practice the manners and customs of South Sea Islanders? That would be hardly less revolting to us than Europeanization was to Saigo. In the first year of Meiji, 1868, the Tokugawa army had been badly beaten by Saigo at Fushimi, and Field Marshal Tokugawa Keiki had the greatest difficulty in getting down to the sea and escaping to Yedo. The Imperial Army proceeded along the Tokaido Road, determined to break up the Tokugawa force. Their advance guard had reached Hiratsuka under Mount Fuji on the coast. It was a spring day, the 5th of April, and the cherry trees were in full bloom. The country folk had come in to see the victorious troops, who formed the advance guard of those who had beaten the Tokugawa. There were many beggars about, together with peddlers and sellers of sweets, roasted potatoes, and what not. Towards evening, clouds came over the skies. At five o'clock, rain began. At six, everyone was under cover. At the principal inn were a party of the headquarters staff officers, including the gallant Saigo. They were making the best of the bad weather and not feeling particularly lively when they heard the soft and melodious notes of the shakuhachi at the gate. That is the poor blind beggar we saw playing near the temple today, said one. Yes, so it is, said another. The poor fellow must be very wet and miserable. Let us call him in. Capital idea, assented all of them, among whom was Saigo Takamori. We will have him in and raise a subscription for him if he can raise our spirits in this weather. They gave the landlord an order to admit the blind flute player. The poor man was led in by a side door and brought into the presence of the officers. Gentlemen, said he, you have done me a very great honor and a kindness, for it is not pleasant to stand outside playing in the rain with cotton clothes on. I think I can repay you, for I am said to play the shakuhachi well. Since I have been blind, it has become my only pleasure, and not only that, but also my only means of living. It is hard now in these unsettled days, when everything is upside down, to earn a living. Not many travelers come to the inns while the imperial troops occupy them. These are hard days, gentlemen. They may be hard days for you, poor blind fellow, but say nothing against the imperial troops, for we have to be suspicious, there being spies of the Tokugawa. Three eyes, indeed, does each of us need in his head. Well, well, I have no wish to say aught against the imperial troops, said the blind man. All I have to say is that it is precious hard for a blind man to earn enough rice wherewith to fill his stomach. Only once a week, on average, am I called to play to private parties, or to shampoo some rheumatic person such as this wet weather produces. The blessing of the gods be on it. Well, we will see what we can do for you, poor fellow, said Saigo. Go round the room and see what you can collect, and then we will start the concert. Matsuichi did as he was bid, and returned to Saigo some ten minutes later with five or six yen, to which Saigo added, saying, There, poor fellow, what do you think of that? Say no more that the imperial troops cause you to have an empty belly. Say, rather, that if you lived near them long, the skin of your belly might become so overstretched as to cause you perforce to open your eyes, and then indeed you might find yourself put about for a trade. But let us hear your music. We are dull of spirit tonight and want enlivening. 
Oh, gentlemen, this is too much, far too much for my poor music. Take some of it back. No, no, they answered. We are troops and officers of the Imperial Army. Our lives are uncertain from day to day. It is a pleasure to give and to enjoy music when we can. The blind man began to play, and he played long and late. Sometimes his airs were lively, and at other times as mournful as the spring wind which blew through the cherry trees. But his manner was enchanting, and all were grateful to him for having afforded a night's amusement. At eleven o'clock the concert finished, and they went to rest. The blind beggar left the inn, and Katos Chibe, the proprietor, locked it up, in spite of the sentries posted outside. The inn was surrounded by hedges, and several clumps of bamboos stood in the corners. At the far end was an artificial mountain with a lake at its foot, and near the lake a little summer house, over which towered a huge and ancient pine tree, one of the branches of which stretched right back over the roof of the inn. At about one o'clock in the morning, the form of a man might have been seen stealthily climbing this huge tree until he had reached the branch which hung over the inn. There he stretched himself flat and began squirming along, evidently intent upon reaching the upper floor of the house. Unfortunately for himself, he cracked a small branch of dead wood, and the sound caused a sentry to look up. "'Who goes there?' cried he, bringing his musket round. But there was no answer. The sentry shouted for help, and it was not more than twenty seconds before the whole house was up and out. No escape for the man on the tree was possible. He was taken prisoner. Imagine the astonishment of all when they found that he was the blind beggar, but now not blind at all. His eyes flashed fire of indignation at his captors, for the great plan of his young life was dead. Who is he? cried one and all, and why the trickery of being blind last evening? A spy, that's what he is, a Tokugawa spy, said one. Take him to headquarters, so that the chief officers may interrogate him, and be careful to hold his hands, for he has every appearance of being a samurai and a fighter. And so the prisoner was led off to the temple of Homanji, where the headquarters of the staff temporarily were. The prisoner was brought into the presence of Saigo Takamori and four other imperial officers, one of whom was Katsura Kogoro. He was made to kneel. Then Saigo, who was the chief, said, Hold your head up and give us your name. The prisoner answered, I am Watanabe Tatsuzo. I am one of those who have the honor of belonging to the bodyguard of the Tokugawa government. You are bold, said Saigo. Will you have the goodness to tell us why you have been masquerading as a blind beggar, and why you were caught in an attempt to break into the inn? I found that the imperial ambassador was sleeping there, and our cause is not bettered by killing ordinary officers. You are a fool, answered Saigo. How much better would you find yourself off if you killed Yanagiwara, Hashimoto, or Katsura? Your question is stupid, was the unabashed answer. Every man of us does his little. My efforts are only a fragment, but little by little we shall gain our ends. Have you a comrade here? asked Saigo. Oh no, answered the prisoner. We act individually as we think best for the cause. It was my intention to kill anyone of importance whose death might strengthen us. I was acting entirely as I thought best. And Saigo said, Your loyalty does you credit, and I admire you for that. But you should recognize that after the last victory of the imperial troops at Fushimi, the Tokugawa's tenure of office, extending over 300 years, has come to an end. It is only natural that the imperial family should return to power. Your intention is presumably to support a power that is finished. Have you never heard the proverb which says that no single support can hold a falling tower? Now tell me truthfully the absurd ideas which appear to exist in your mind. Do you really think that the Tokugawa have any further chance? If you were any other than the heroic or admirable Saigo, I should refuse to answer these questions, said the prisoner. But, as you are the great Saigo Takamori, and I admire your loyalty and courage, I will confess that after our defeat some two hundred of us samurai formed into a society swearing to sacrifice our lives to the cause in any way that we were able. I regret to say that nearly all ran away, and that I am, as far as I am able to judge, about the only one left. As you will execute me, there will be none. Stop, cried Saigo. Say no more. Let me ask you. Will you not join us? Look upon the Tokugawa as dead. Too many faithful but ignorant samurai have died for them. The imperial family must reign. Nine-tenths of the country demand it. Though your guilt stands confessed, your loyalty is admirable, and we should gladly take you to our side think before you answer. No thought was necessary. Watanabe Tatsuzo answered instantly. No, never. 
though alone i will not be unfaithful to my cause you'd better behead me before the day dawns i see the strength of your arguments that the imperial family must and should reign but that cannot alter my decision with regard to my own fate saigo stood up and said here is a man whom we must respect there are many tokugawa who have joined our cause through fear but they retain hate in their hearts look all of you at this watanabe and forget him not for he is a noble man and true to the death so saying saigo bowed to watanabe and then turning to the guard said take the prisoner to the sambon matsu and behead him as soon as the day dawns footnote sambon matsu is three pines end of footnote watanabe tatsuzo was led forth and executed accordingly there is a crossroad on the way leading to mariko on the right of the nita ferry some five or six cho from the hill where is the homanji temple ikigami in abaragun tokyo fu where there is a little grave with a tombstone over it with characters written thereon they mean tomb of futsetsushi and it is here that watanabe tatsuzo is said to have been buried end of chapter thirty six recording by colleen mcmahon Chapter 37 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. The Kakemono Ghost of Aki Province. Footnote. About 250 years ago, a strange legend was attached to a kakemono which was painted by an artist celebrity, Sawara Kameju by name, and, owing to the reasons given in the story, the kakemono was handed over to the safekeeping of the head priest of the Korinji Temple. End of footnote. Down the inland sea, between Umadaichi and Kore, now a great naval port, and in the province of Aki, there is a small village called Yaiyama, in which lived a painter of some note, Abe Tenko. Abe Tenko taught more than he painted, and relied for his living mostly on the small means to which he had succeeded at his father's death, and on the aspiring artists who boarded in the village for the purpose of taking daily lessons from him. The island and rock scenery in the neighborhood afforded continual study, and Tenko was never short of pupils. Among them was one scarcely more than a boy, being only seventeen years of age. His name was Sawara Kameju, and a most promising pupil he was. He had been sent to Tenko over a year before, when scarce sixteen years of age, and for the reason that Tenko had been a friend of his father, Sawara was taken under the roof of the artist and treated as if he had been his son. Tenko had had a sister who went into the service of the Lord of Aki, by whom she had a daughter. Had the child been a son, it would have been adopted into the Aki family. But being a daughter, it was, according to Japanese custom, sent back to its mother's family, with the result that Tenko took charge of the child, whose name was Kimi. The mother being dead, the child had lived with him for sixteen years. Our story opens with Okimi grown into a pretty girl. Okimi was a most devoted adopted daughter to Tenko. She attended almost entirely to his household affairs, and Tenko looked upon her as if, indeed, she were his own daughter, instead of an illegitimate niece, trusting her in everything. After the arrival of the young student, Okimi's heart gave her much trouble. She fell in love with him. Sawara admired Okimi greatly, but of love he never said a word, being too much absorbed in his study. He looked upon Kimi as a sweet girl, taking his meals with her and enjoying her society. He would have fought for her, and he loved her, but he never gave himself time to think that she was not his sister, and that he might make love to her. So it came to pass, at last, that Okimi, one day, with the pains of love in her heart, availed herself of her guardian's absence at the temple, whither he had gone to paint something for the priests. Okimi screwed up her courage and made love to Sawara. She told him that since he had come to the house, her heart had known no peace. She loved him and would like to marry him if he did not mind. This simple and maiden-like request, accompanied by the offer of tea, was more than young Sawara was able to answer without acquiescence. After all, it did not much matter, thought he. Kimi is a most beautiful and charming girl, and I like her very much, and must marry some day. 
So Sawara told Kimi that he loved her, and would be only too delighted to marry her when his studies were complete, say, two or three years thence. Kimi was overjoyed, and, on the return of the good Tenko from Korinji Temple, informed her guardian of what had passed. Sawara set to with renewed vigor, and worked diligently, improving very much in his style of painting and after a year Tenko thought it would do him good to finish off his studies in Kyoto under an old friend of his own, a painter named Sumiyoshi Miyokei. Thus it was that in the spring of the sixth year of Kyoho, that is, in 1721, Sawara bade farewell to Tenko and his pretty niece Okimi, and started forth to the capital. It was a sad parting. Sawara had grown to love Kimi very deeply, and he vowed that as soon as his name was made, he would return and marry her. In the olden days, the Japanese were even more shockingly poor correspondents than they are now, and even lovers or engaged couples did not write to each other, as several of my tales may show. After Sawara had been away for a year, it seemed that he should write and say at all events how he was getting on, but he did not do so. A second year passed, and still there was no news. In the meantime, there had been several admirers of Okimi's who had proposed Tenko for her hand, but Tenko had invariably said that Kimi-san was already engaged, until one day he heard from Miyokei, the painter in Kyoto, who told him that Sawara was making splendid progress, and that he was most anxious that the youth should marry his daughter. He felt that he must ask his old friend Tenko first, and before speaking to Sawara. Tenko, on the other hand, had an application from a rich merchant for Okimi's hand. What was Tenko to do? Sawara showed no signs of returning. On the contrary, it seemed that Miyokei was anxious to get him to marry into his family. That must be a good thing for Sawara, he thought. Miyokei is a better teacher than I, and if Sawara marries his daughter, he will take more interest than ever in my old pupil. Also, it is advisable that Kimi should marry that rich young merchant, if I can persuade her to do so. But it will be difficult, for she loves Sawara still. I am afraid he has forgotten her. A little strategy I will try, and tell her that Miyokei has written to tell me that Sawara is going to marry his daughter. Then, possibly, she may feel sufficiently vengeful to agree to marry the young merchant. Arguing thus to himself, he wrote to Miyokei to say that he had his full consent to ask Sawara to be his son-in-law, and he wished him every success in the effort, and in the evening he spoke to Kimi. Kimi, he said, today I have had news of Sawara through my friend Miyokei. Oh, do tell me what, cried the excited Kimi. Is he coming back, and has he finished his education? How delighted I shall be to see him. We can be married in April when the cherry blooms, and he can paint a picture of our first picnic. I fear, Kimi, the news which I have does not talk of his coming back. On the contrary, I am asked by Miyokei to allow Sawara to marry his daughter, and, as I think such a request could not have been made had Sawara been faithful to you, I have answered that I have no objection to the union. And now, as for yourself, I deeply regret to tell you this, but as your uncle and guardian, I again wish to impress upon you the advisability of marrying Yorozoya, the young merchant who is deeply in love with you and in every way a most desirable husband. Indeed, I must insist upon it, for I think it is most desirable. Poor Kimi-san broke into tears and deep sobs, and without answering a word, went to her room, where Tenko thought it well to leave her alone for the night. In the morning she had gone, none knew whither, there being no trace of her. Up in Kyoto, Sawara continued his studies, true and faithful to Okimi. After receiving Tenko's letter approving of Miyokei's asking Sawara to become his son-in-law, Miyokei asked Sawara if he would so honor him. When you marry my daughter, we shall be a family of painters, and I think you will be one of the most celebrated ones that Japan ever had. But sir, cried Sawara, I cannot do myself the honor of marrying your daughter, for I am already engaged, I have been for the last three years, to Kimi, Tenko's daughter. It is most strange that he should not have told you. There was nothing for Miyokei to say to this, but there was much for Sawara to think about. Foolish, perhaps he then thought, were the ways of Japanese in not corresponding more freely. He wrote to Kimi twice accordingly, but no answer came. Then Miyokei fell ill of a chill and died 
So Suwara returned to his village home in Aki, where he was welcomed by Tenko, who was now, without Okimi, lonely in his old age. When Suwara heard that Kimi had gone away, leaving neither address nor letter, he was very angry, for he had not been told the reason. An ungrateful and bad girl, said he to Tenko, and I have been lucky indeed in not marrying her. Yes, yes, said Tenko, you have been lucky, but you must not be too angry. Women are queer things, and, as the saying goes, when you see water running uphill and hens laying square eggs, you may expect to see a truly honest-minded woman. But come now, I want to tell you that as I am growing old and feeble, I wish to make you the master of my house and property here. You must take my name and marry. Feeling disgusted at Okimi's conduct, Sawara readily consented. A pretty young girl, daughter of a wealthy farmer, was found, Kiku, the chrysanthemum, and she and Sawara lived happily with old Tenko, keeping his house and minding his estate. Sawara painted in his spare time. Little by little, he became quite famous. One day, the Lord of Aki sent for him and said it was his wish that Sawara should paint the seven beautiful scenes of the islands of Kabakarijima, six, probably. The pictures were to be mounted on gold screens. This was the first commission that Sawara had had from such a high official. He was very proud of it, and went off to the upper and lower Kabakari Islands, where he made rough sketches. He went also to the rocky islands of Shikokujima, and to the little uninhabited island of Daikokujima, where an adventure befell him. Strolling along the shore, he met a girl, tanned by sun and wind. She wore only a red cotton cloth about her loins, and her hair fell upon her shoulders. She had been gathering shellfish, and had a basket of them under her arm. Sawara thought it strange that he should meet a single woman in so wild a place, and more so still when she addressed him, saying, Surely you are Sawara Kameju, are you not? Yes, answered Sawara, I am. But it is very strange that you should know me. May I ask how you do so? If you are Sawara, as I know you are, you should know me without asking, for I am no other than Kimi, to whom you are engaged. Sawara was astonished and hardly knew what to say. So he asked her questions as to how she had come to this lonely island. Okimi explained everything and ended by saying, with a smile of happiness upon her face, And since, my dearest Sawara, I understand that what I was told is false, and that you did not marry Miyoke's daughter, and that we have been faithful to each other, we can be married and happy after all. Oh, think how happy we shall be! Alas, alas, my dear Kimi, it cannot be! I was led to suppose that you had deserted our benefactor Tenko and given up all thought of me. Oh, the sadness of it all, the wickedness! I have been persuaded that you were faithless and have been made to marry another. Okimi made no answer, but began to run along the shore, towards a little hut, which home she had made for herself. She ran fast, and Sawara ran after her, calling, Kimi, Kimi, stop and speak to me! But Kimi did not stop. She gained her hut, and seizing a knife, plunged it into her throat, and fell back, bleeding to death. Sawara, greatly grieved, burst into tears. It was horrible to see the girl who might have been his bride lying dead at his feet, all covered with blood, and having suffered so horrible a death at her own hands. Greatly impressed, he drew paper from his pocket and made a sketch of the body. Then he and his boatmen buried Okimi above the tide mark near the primitive hut. Afterwards, at home, with a mournful heart, he painted a picture of the dead girl and hung it in his room. On the first night that it was hung, Sawara had a dreadful dream. On awakening, he found the figure on the kakemono seemed to be alive. The ghost of Okimi stepped out of it and stood near his bed. Night after night, the ghost appeared, until sleep and rest for Sawara were no longer possible. There was nothing to be done, thought he, but to send his wife back to her parents, which he did and the kakemono he presented to the Karinji temple, where the priest kept it with great care and daily prayed for the spirit of Okimi-san. After that, Sawara saw the ghost no more. The kakemono is called the ghost picture of Tenko II, and is said to be still kept in the Karinji temple, where it was placed some 230 to 240 years ago. End of chapter 37 Recording by Colleen McMahon Chapter 38 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith white saki two thousand or more years ago lake biwa in omi province and mount fuji in suruga province came into being in one night though my story relates this as fact you are fully entitled to say should you feel so inclined wonderful indeed are the ways of nature but do so respectfully if you please and without levity for otherwise you will grossly offend and will not understand the ethical ideas of japanese folklore stories well at the time of this extraordinary geographical event there lived one urine a man of poor means even for those days he loved sake wine and scarcely ever spent a day without drinking some of it urine lived near the place which is now called suzukawa a little to the north of the river known as fujikawa on the day which followed fuji san's appearance urine became ill and was in consequence unable to drink his cup of sake he became worse and worse and at last feeling that there could be no hope for him decided to give himself the pleasure of drinking a cup before he died accordingly he called to himself his only son koryuri a boy of fourteen years and told him to go and fetch him a cup or two of the wine koyuri was sorely perplexed he had no sake in the house and there was not a single coin left wherewith to buy this he did not like to tell his father fearing that the unpleasant state of affairs might make him worse so he took his gourd and went wandering along the beach wondering how he could get what his father wanted while thus employed koyuri heard a voice calling him by name as he looked up towards the pines which fringed the beach he saw a man and a woman sitting beneath an immense tree their hair was a scarlet red and so were their bodies at first koyuri was afraid he had never seen their like before but the voice was kindly and the man was making signs to him to approach koyuri did so in fear and trembling but with that coolness with which characterizes the japanese boy as koyuri approached the strange people he noticed that they were drinking sake from large flat cups known as saka de zuki and that on the sand beside them was an immense jar from which they took the liquor moreover he noticed that the sake was whiter than any he had seen before thinking always of his father koyuri unslung his gourd reported his father's illness and begged for sake the red man took the gourd and filled it after expressing gratitude koyuri ran off delighted here father here said he as he reached his hut i have got you the sake the best i have ever seen and i am sure it tastes as good as it looks try it and tell me the old man took the wine and drank greedily expressing great satisfaction and said was indeed the best he had ever tasted next day he wanted more the boy found his two red friends and again they filled the gourd in short koyuri had his gourd filled for five days in succession 
and his father had regained spirits and was almost well in consequence now there lived in the next hut to urine an unpleasant neighbor who was also fond of sake but too poor to procure it his name was mammy kiko on hearing that urine had been drinking sake for the last five days he became furiously jealous and calling koryuri asked where and how he had procured it the boy explained that he had got it from the strange people with red hair who had been living near the big pine tree for some days past give me your gourd to taste cried mammy kiko snatching it roughly do you think that your father is the only man who is good enough for sake putting the gourd to his lips he began to drink but he threw it down in disgust a second later and spat out what was in his mouth what filth is this he cried to your father you give the most excellent sake while to me you give foul water what is the meaning of it he gave koyuri a sound beating and then told him to lead the way to the red people on the beach saying i will beat you again if i don't get some good sake so you had better see to it koyuri led the way weeping the while at the loss of his sake which mammy kiko had thrown away and fearing the anger of his red friends in the usual place they found the strangers who had both been drinking and were still doing so mammy kiko was surprised at their appearance he had seen nothing quite like them before their bodies were of the pink of cherry blossom shining in the sun while their long red hair almost frightened him both were naked except for a green girdle made of some curious seaweed well boy koyuri what are you crying about and why back so soon has your father drunk the sake already if so he must be almost as fond of it as we no no my father has not drunk it but mammy kiko here took it from me and drank some spitting it out and saying it was not sake the rest he threw away and then made me bring him here may i have some more for my father the red man refilled the gourd and told him not to mind and seemed amused at koyuri's account of mammy kiko spitting it out i am as fond of sake as any one cried mammy kiko will you give me some oh yes help yourself said the red man help yourself mammy kiko filled the largest of the cups and putting it to his nose smelt the fragrance which was delicious but as soon as he put it to his lips his face changed and he had to spit again for the taste was nauseating what is the meaning of this he cried angrily and the red man answered still more angrily you do not seem to be aware of who i am well i will tell you that i am a shoujo of high degree and i live deep in the bottom of the ocean near the sea dragon's palace recently we heard that a sacred mountain had arisen on the edge of the sea and as it is a lucky omen and a sign that the empire of japan will exist in perpetuity i have come here to see it while enjoying the magnificent scene from suruga coast i met this good boy koyuri who asked for sake for his poor sick old father and i gave him some now this sake is not ordinary sake but sacred and those who drink it live for ever and retain their youth 
moreover it cures all diseases even in the aged but you must know that any medicine is sometimes a poison and thus it is that this sweet sacred white sake is good only in taste to the righteous and bad tasting and poisonous to the wicked thus i know that as it tastes evil to you you are an evil and wicked man selfish and greedy and both the sojos laughed at mammy kiko who on hearing that the few drops which he must have swallowed would act as a poison and soon kill him begged to cry with fear and to regret his conduct he begged and implored forgiveness and that his life might be spared and vowed that he would reform if only given a chance the shoujo drawing some powder from a case gave it to mamikiko and told him to swallow it in some sake for said he it is better to repent and reform even in your old age than not at all mamikiko drank it down this time finding the wine sweet and delicious it strengthened him and made him feel well and he reformed and became a good man he made friends again with urine and treated koyuri well some years later mamikiko and urine built a hut at the southern base of fuji san where they brewed white sake from a recipe given them by the shoujo and they gave it to all who suffered from sake poisoning both mamikiko and urine lived for three hundred years in the middle ages a man who had heard this story brewed white sake at the foot of mount fuji he made it with rice yeast and people became very fond of it even today white sake is brewed somewhere at the foot of the mountain and is well known as a special liqueur belonging to fiji i myself drank it in 1907 without fear of living beyond my 55th year end of chapter 38 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 39 of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith The Blind Beauty Nearly 300 years ago, or, according to my storyteller, in the second year of Kawani, which would be 1626 the period of kawani having begun in 1624 and ended in 1644 there lived at maidazuru in the province of tango a youth named kichijuro kichijuro had been born at the village of tai where his father had been a native but on the death of the father he had come with his elder brother kichisuke to maidazuro the brother was his only living relation except an uncle and had taken care of him for four years educating him from the age of eleven until fifteen and kichijiro was very grateful and determined that now he had reached the age of fifteen he must no longer be a drag on his brother but must begin to make a way in the world for himself after looking about for some weeks 
Kichijiro found employment with Shiwoya Hachiyemon, a merchant in Maizuru. He worked very hard and soon gained his master's friendship. Indeed, Hachiyemon thought very highly of his apprentice. He favored him in many ways over older clerks, and finally entrusted him with the key of his safes, which contained documents and much money. Now Hachiyemon had a daughter of Kichijiro's age, of great beauty and promise, and she felt desperately in love with Kichijiro, who himself was at first unaware of this. The girl's name was Ima, O Ima san, and she was one of those delightfully ruddy, happy faced girls whom only Japan can produce. A mixture of yellow and red, with hair and eyebrows as black as a raven. Ima paid Kichijiro compliments now and then, but he was a boy who thought little of love he intended to get on in the world and marriage was a thing which had not yet entered into his mind after kichijiro had been some six months in the employment of hachiyemon he stood higher than ever in the master's estimation but the other clerks did not like him they were jealous one was specially so this was kanshichi who hated him not only because he was favored by the merchant but also because he himself loved oima who had given him many a rebuff when he had attempted to make love to her so great did this secret hate become at last kanshichi vowed that he would be revenged upon kichijiro and if necessary upon his master hachiyemon and his daughter oima as well for he was a wicked and scheming man one day an opportunity occurred kichijiro had so far secured confidence that the master had sent him off to kasumi in tajima province there to negotiate the purchase of a junk while he was away can Sichi broke into the room where the safe was kept and took therefrom two bags containing money in gold up to the value of two hundred ryo he effaced all signs of his action and went quietly back to his work two or three days later kichijiro returned having successfully accomplished his mission and after reporting this to the master set to his routine work again on examining the safe he found that the two hundred ryo of gold were missing and he having reported this the office and the household were thrown into a state of excitement after some hours of hunting for the money it was found in a koro incense burner which belonged to kichijiro and no one was more surprised than he it was kanshichi who had found it naturally after having put it there himself he did not accuse kichijiro of having stolen the money his plans were more deeply laid the money having been found there he knew that kichijiro himself would have to say something of course kichijiro said he was absolutely innocent and that when he had left for kasumi the money was safe he had seen it just before leaving hachiyemon was sorely distressed he believed in the innocence of kichijiro but how was he to prove it seeing that his master did not believe kichijiro guilty kan shichi decided that he must do something which would render it more or less impossible for hachiyemon to do otherwise than to send his hated rival 
kichijiro away he went to the master and said sir i as your head clerk must tell you that though perhaps kichijiro is innocent things seem to prove that he is not for how could the money have got into his koro if he is not punished the theft will reflect on all of us clerks your faithful servants and i myself should have to leave your service for all the others would do so and you would be unable to carry on your business therefore i venture to tell you sir that it would be advisable in your own interest to send poor kichijiro for whose misfortune i deeply grieve away hachimon saw the force of this argument and agreed he sent for kichijiro to whom he said kichijiro deeply as i regret it i am obliged to send you away i do not believe in your guilt but i know that if i do not send you away all my clerks will leave me and i shall be ruined to show you that i believe in your innocence i will tell you that my daughter ima loves you and that if you are willing and after you can prove your innocence nothing would give me greater pleasure than to have you back as my son-in-law go now try and think how you can prove your innocence my best wishes go with you kichijiro was very sad now that he had to go he found that he should more than miss the companionship of the sweet o ima with tears in his eyes he vowed to the father that he would come back prove his innocence and marry o ima and with o ima herself he had his first love seen they vowed that neither should rest until the scheming thief had been discovered and they were both reunited in such a way that nothing could part them kichijiro went back to his brother kichisuke at tai village to consult as to what it would be best for him to do to re-establish his reputation after a few weeks he was employed through his brother's interest and that of his only surviving uncle in kyoto there he worked hard and faithfully for four long years bringing much credit to his firm and earning much admiration from his uncle who made him heir to considerable landed property and gave him a share in his own business kichijiro found himself at the age of twenty quite a rich man in the meantime calamity had come on pretty o ima after kichijiro had left madazuru kan si chi began to pester her with attentions she would have none of him she would not even speak to him and so exasperated did he become at last that he used to waylay her on one occasion he resorted to violence and tried to carry her away by force of this she complained to her father who promptly dismissed him from his service this made villain kan shi chi angrier than ever as the japanese proverb says kawasia amati nikusa ya hayakubai which means excessive love is hatred so it was with kan si chi his love turned to hatred he thought how he could be avenged on hachimon and oima the most simple means he thought would be to burn down their house the business offices and the stores of merchandise that must bring ruin so one night kan shi chi set about doing these things and accomplished them most successfully with the exception that he himself 
was caught in the act and sentenced to a heavy punishment that was the only satisfaction which was got by hachimon who was all but ruined he sent away all his clerks and retired from business for he was too old to begin again with just enough to keep life and body together hachimon and his pretty daughter lived in a little cheap cottage on the banks of the river where it was hachimon's only pleasure to fish for carp and jacko for three years he did this and then fell ill and died poor o ima was left to herself as lovely as ever but mournful the few friends she had tried to prevail on her to marry somebody anybody they said sooner than live alone but to this advice the girl would not listen it is better to live miserably alone she said than to marry one for whom you do not care i can love none but kijiro though i shall not see him again oima spoke the truth on that occasion without knowing it for true as it is that it never rains but it pours oima was to have more trouble an eye sickness came to her and in less than two months after her father's death the poor girl was blind with no one to attend to her wants but an old nurse who was stuck to her through all her troubles ima had barely sufficient money to pay for rice it was just at this time that kichijiro's success was assured his uncle had given him a half interest in the business and made a will in which he left him his whole property kichijiro decided to go and report himself to his old master at madaziro and to claim the hand of oima his daughter having learned the sad story of downfall and ruin and also of ima's blindness kichijiro went to the girl's cottage poor o ima came out and flung herself into his arms weeping bitterly and crying kichijiro my beloved this is indeed almost the hardest blow of all the loss of my sight was as nothing before but now that you have come back i cannot see you and how i long to do so you can but little imagine it is indeed the saddest blow of all you cannot now marry me kichijiro petted her and said dearest ima you must not be too hasty in your thoughts i have never ceased thinking of you indeed i have grown to love you desperately i have property now in kyoto but should you prefer to do so we will live here in this cottage i am ready to do anything you wish it is my desire to re-establish your father's old business for the good of your family but first and before even this we will be married and never part again we will do that to-morrow then we will go together to kyoto and see my uncle and ask for his advice he is always good and kind and you will like him he is sure to like you next day they started on their journey to kyoto and kichijiro saw his brother and his uncle neither of whom had any objection to kichijiro's bride on account of her blindness indeed the uncle was so much pleased at his nephew's fidelity that he gave him half of his capital there and then kichijiro built a new house and offices in madaziro just where his first master hachimon's place had been he re-established the business completely calling his firm the second shiwoa hachimon 
as is often done in japan which adds much to the confusion of europeans who study japanese art for pupils often take the names of their clever masters calling themselves the second or even the third or the fourth in the garden of their Mazuro home was an artificial mountain and on this kichijiro had erected a tombstone or memorial dedicated to hachimon his father-in-law at the foot of the mountain he erected a memorial to can chi thus he rewarded the evil wickedness of can shi chi by kindness but showed at the same time that evil doers cannot expect high places it is to be hoped that the spirits of the two dead men become reconciled they say in madzuru that the memorial tombs still stand end of chapter 39 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter 40 of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith the secret of idamachi pond in the first year of bunkyu eighteen sixty one to eighteen sixty four there lived a man called yehara keisuke in kasumigaseki in the district of kojimachi he was a hatamoto that is a feudatory vassal of the shogun and a man to whom some respect was due but apart from that yehara was much liked for his kindness of heart and general fairness in dealing with people in idamachi lived another hatamoto hayashi hayato he had been married to yehara's sister for five years they were exceedingly happy their daughter four years old now was the delight of their hearts their cottage was rather dilapidated but it was hayashi's own with the pond in front of it and two farms the whole property comprising some two hundred acres of which nearly half was under cultivation thus hayashi was able to live without working much in the summer he fished for carp in the winter he wrote much and was considered a bit of a poet at the time of this story hayashi having planted his rice and sweet potatoes sato imo had but little to do and spent most of his time with his wife fishing in his ponds one of which contained large suppon terrapin turtles as well as koi carp suddenly things went wrong yehara was surprised one morning to receive a visit from his sister okome i have come dear brother she said to beg you to help me to obtain a divorce or separation from my husband divorce why should you want a divorce have you not always said you were happy with your husband my dear friend hayashi for what sudden reason do you ask for a divorce remember you have been married for five years now and that is sufficient to prove that your life has been happy and that hayashi has treated you well at first o kome would not give any reason why she wished to be separated from her husband but at last she said brother think not that hayashi has been unkind he is all that can be called kind and we deeply love each other but as you know hayashi's family have owned the land the farms on one of which latter we live for some three hundred years nothing would induce him to change his place of abode and i should never have wished him to do so until some twelve days ago what has happened within these twelve wonderful days asked yehara dear brother i can stand it no longer was his sister's answer up to twelve days ago all went well but then a terrible thing happened it was very dark and warm and i was sitting outside our house 
looking at the clouds passing over the moon and talking to my daughter suddenly there appeared as if walking on the lilies of the pond a white figure oh so white so wet and so miserable to look at it appeared to rise from the pond and float in the air and then approached me slowly until it was within ten feet as it came my child cried why mother there comes o sumi do you know o sumi i answered her that i did not i think but in truth i was so frightened i hardly know what i said the figure was horrible to look at it was that of a girl of eighteen or nineteen years with hair dishevelled and hanging loose over white and wet shoulders help me help me cried the figure and i was so frightened that i covered my eyes and screamed for my husband who was inside he came out and found me in a dead faint with my child by my side also in a state of terror hayashi had seen nothing he carried us both in shut the doors and told me i must have been dreaming perhaps he sarcastically added you saw the kappa which is said to dwell in the pond but which none of my family have seen for over one hundred years that is all my husband said on the subject next night however when in bed my child seized me suddenly crying in terror-stricken tones o oh, sumi here is o oh, sumi how horrible she looks mother mother do you see her i did see her she stood dripping wet within three feet of my bed the whiteness and the wetness and the dishevelled hair being what gave her the awful look which she bore help me help me cried the figure and then disappeared after that i could not sleep nor could i get my child to do so on every night until now the ghost has come o oh, sumi as my child calls her i should kill myself if i had to remain longer in that house which has become a terror to myself and my child my husband does not see the ghost and only laughs at me and that is why i see no way out of the difficulty but a separation yehara told his sister that on the following day he would call on hayashi and sent his sister back to her husband that night next day when yehara called hayashi after hearing what the visitor had to say answered it is very strange i was born in this house over twenty years ago but i have never seen the ghost which my wife refers to and have never heard about it not the slightest allusion to it was ever made by my father or mother i will make inquiries of all my neighbours and servants and ascertain if they ever heard of the ghost or even of any one coming to a sudden and untimely end there must be something it is impossible that my little child should know the name sumi she never having known any one bearing it inquiries were made but nothing could be learned from the servants or from the neighbours hayashi reasoned that the ghost being always wet the mystery might be solved by drying up the pond perhaps to find the remains of some murdered person whose bones required decent burial and prayers said over them the pond was old and deep covered with water plants and had never been emptied within his memory it was said to contain a kappa mythical beast half turtle half man in any case there were many terrapin turtle the capture of which would well repay the cost of the emptying the bank of the pond was cut and next day there remained only a pool in the deepest part hayashi decided to clear even this and dig into the mud below at this moment the grandmother of hayashi arrived an old woman of some eighty years and said you need go no farther i can tell you all about the ghost o oh, sumi does not rest and it is quite true that her ghost appears i am very sorry about it now in my old age for it is my fault the sin is mine listen and i will tell you all everyone stood astonished at these words feeling that some secret was about to be revealed the old woman continued 
when hayashi hayato your grandfather was alive we had a beautiful servant girl seventeen years of age called o sumi your grandfather became enamoured of this girl and she of him i was about thirty at that time and was jealous for my better looks had passed away one day when your grandfather was out i took sumi to the pond and gave her a severe beating during the struggle she fell into the water and got entangled in the weeds and there i left her fully believing the water to be shallow and that she could get out she did not succeed and was drowned your grandfather found her dead on his return in those days the police were not very particular with their inquiries the girl was buried but nothing was said to me and the matter soon blew over fourteen days ago was the fiftieth anniversary of this tragedy perhaps that is the reason of sumi's ghost appearing for appear she must or your child could not have known of her name it must be as your child says and that the first time she appeared sumi communicated her name the old woman was shaking with fear and advised them all to say prayers at o sumi's tomb this was done and the ghost has been seen no more hayashi said though i am a samurai and have read many books i never believed in ghosts but now i do end of chapter forty recording by rob marland chapter forty one of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith The Spirit of Yanoki Footnote Fuja Sei said that this was an old story told him by his nurse, who was a native of the village of Okiyama, also that a solid gold Buddha, eighteen inches in height, had been stolen from the temple three years ago. End footnote. There is a mountain in the province of Itsumi called Okiyama, or Ojiyama. It is connected with the Mumaru Yama Mountains. I will not vouch that I am accurate in spelling either. Suffice it to say that the story was told to me by Fukuga Sei and translated by Mr. Ando, the Japanese translator of our consulate at Kobe. Both of these give the mountain's name as Okiyama and say that on the top of it, from time immemorial, there has been a shrine dedicated to Fudo Mayo'o, a chala in Sanskrit, which means immovable, and is the god always represented as surrounded by fire and sitting uncomplainingly on as an example to others and he carries a sword in one hand and a rope in the other as a warning that punishment awaits those who are unable to overcome with honor the painful struggles of life well at the top of okiyama high or big mountain is this very old temple to fudo and many are the pilgrimages which are made there annually the mountain itself is covered with forest and there are some remarkable cryptomerias camphor and pine trees many years ago in the days of which i speak there were only a few priests living up at this temple among them was a middle-aged man half priest half caretaker called yanoki for twenty years had yanoki lived at the temple 
yet during that time he had never cast his eyes on the figure of fudo over which he was partly set to guard it was kept shut in a shrine and never seen by any one but the head priest one day yenoki's curiosity got the better of him early in the morning the door of the shrine was not quite closed yenoki looked in but saw nothing on turning to the light again he found that he had lost the use of the eye that had looked he was stone blind in the right eye feeling that the divine punishment served him well and that the gods must be angry he set about purifying himself and fasted for one hundred days yenoki was mistaken in his way of devotion and repentance and did not pacify the gods on the contrary they turned him into a tengu long-nosed devil who dwells in mountains and is the great teacher of jujitsu but yenoki continued to call himself a priest ichigan hoshi meaning the one-eyed priest for a year and then died and it is said that his spirit passed into an enormous cryptomeria tree on the east side of the mountain after that when sailors passed the chinu sea Oska bay if there was a storm they used to pray to the one-eyed priest for help and if a light was seen on the top of okiyama they had a sure sign that no matter how rough the sea their ship would not be lost it may be said in fact that after death of the one-eyed priest more importance was attached to his spirit and to the tree into which it had taken refuge than to the temple itself the tree was called the lodging of the one-eyed priest and no one dared approach it not even the woodcutters who were familiar with the mountains it was a source of awe and an object of reverence at the foot of okiyama was a lonely village separated from others by fully two ri five miles and there were only one hundred and thirty houses in it every year the villages used to celebrate the bon by engaging after it was over in the dance called bon odori like most other things in japan the bon and the bon odori were in extreme contrast the bon was a ceremony arranged for the spirits of the dead who were supposed to return to earth for three days annually to visit their family shrines something like our all saints day and in any case quite a serious religious performance the bon odori is a dance which varies considerably in different provinces it is confined mostly to villages for one cannot count the pretty geisha dances in kyoto which are practically copies of it it is a dance of boys and girls one may say and continues nearly all night on the village green for the three or four nights that it lasts opportunities for flirtations of the most violent kind are plentiful there are no chaperones so to speak and to put it vulgarly every one goes on the bust hitherto virtuous maidens spend the night out as impromptu sweethearts and in the village of which this story is told not only is it they who let themselves go but even young brides also so it came to pass that the village at the foot of okiyama mountain away so far from other villages was a bad one morally there was no restriction to what a girl might do or what she might not do during the nights of the bon odori 
things went from bad to worse until at the time of which i write anarchy reigned during the festive days at last it came to pass that after a particularly festive bond on a beautiful moonlit night in august the well-beloved and charming daughter of kurahashi yoza imon okimi aged eighteen years who had promised her lover kurosuke that she would meet him secretly that evening was on her way to do so after passing the last house in her mountain village she came to a thick copse and standing at the edge of it was a man whom o kimi at first took to be her lover on approaching she found that it was not kurosuke but a very handsome youth of twenty-three years he did not speak to her in fact he kept a little away if she advanced he receded so handsome was the youth o kimi felt that she loved him oh no my heart beats for him said she after all why should i not give up kurosuke he is not good-looking like this man whom i love already before i have even spoken to him i hate kurosuke now that i see this man as she said this she saw the figure smiling and beckoning and being a wicked girl loose in her morals she followed him and was seen no more her family were much exercised in their minds a week passed and o kimi san did not return a few days later tame the sixteen-year-old daughter of kinsaku who was secretly in love with the son of the village headman was awaiting him in the temple grounds standing the while by the stone figure of jizodu sanskrit shitigarbaha patron of women and children suddenly there stood near tamai a handsome youth of twenty-three years as in the case of o kimi she was greatly struck by the youth's beauty so much so that when he took her by the hand and led her off she made no effort to resist and she also disappeared and thus it was that nine girls of amorous nature disappeared from this small village everywhere for thirty miles around people talked and wondered and said unkind things in okiyama village itself the elder people said yes it must be that our children's immodesty since the bon odori has angered yenoki san perhaps it is he himself who appears in the form of this handsome youth and carries off our daughters nearly all agreed in a few days that they owed their losses to the spirit of yenoki tree and as soon as this notion had taken root the whole of the villagers locked and barred themselves in their houses both day and night their farms became neglected wood was not being cut in the mountain business was at a standstill the rumor of this state of affairs spread and the lord of kishiwada becoming uneasy summoned sonobi hayama the most celebrated swordsman in that part of japan sonobi you are the bravest man i know of and the best fighter it is for you to go and inspect the tree where lodges of the spirit of yenoki you must use your own discretion i cannot advise as to what it is best that you should do i leave it to you to dispose of the mystery and the disappearances of the nine girls my lord said sonobi my life is at your lordship's call 
I shall either clear the mystery or die. After this interview with his master, Sonobi went home. He put himself through a course of cleansing. He fasted and bathed for a week, and then repaired to Okiyama. This was in the month of October, when to me things always looked their best. Sonobi ascended the mountain and went first to the temple, which he reached at three o'clock in the afternoon, after a hard climb. Here he said prayers before the god Fudo for fully half an hour. Then he set out to cross the short valley which led up to the Okiyama mountain and to the tree which held the spirit of the one-eyed priest, Yenoki. It was a long and steep climb with no paths, for the mountain was avoided as much as possible by even the most adventurous of woodcutters, none of whom ever dreamed of going up as far as the Yenoki tree. Sonobi was in good training and a bold warrior. The woods were dense. There was a chilling damp which came from the spray of a high waterfall. The solitude was intense, and once or twice Sonobi put his hand on the hilt of his sword, thinking that he heard someone following in the gloom, but there was no one, and by five o'clock Sonobi had reached the tree and addressed it thus, O honorable and aged tree, that has braved centuries of storm thou hast become the home of yenoki's spirit in truth there is much honor in having so stately a lodging and therefore he cannot have been so bad a man i have come from the lord of keshiwada to upbraid him however and to ask what means it that Yenoki's spirit should appear as a handsome youth for the purpose of robbing poor people of their daughters. This must not continue, else you, as the lodging of Yenoki's spirit, will be cut down, so that it may escape to another part of the country. At that moment a warm wind blew on the face of Sonobi, and dark clouds appeared overhead rendering the forest dark rain began to fall and the rumblings of earthquake were heard suddenly the figure of an old priest appeared in ghostly form wrinkled and thin transparent and clammy nerve shattering but sonobi had no fear you have been sent by the lord of kishiwada said the ghost i admire your courage for coming so cowardly and sinful are most men they fear to come near where my spirit has taken refuge i can assure you that i do no evil to the good so bad had morals become in the village it was time to give a lesson the villagers customs defied the gods it is true that i hoping to improve these people and make them godly assumed the form of a youth and carried away nine of the worst of them they are quite well they deeply regret their sins and will reform their village every day i have given them lectures you will find them on the mini toj or second summit of this mountain tied to trees go there and release them and afterwards tell the lord of kishiwada what the spirit of yenoki the one-eyed priest has done and that it is always ready to help him to improve his people farewell no sooner had the last word been spoken then the spirit vanished. Sonobi, who felt somewhat dazed by what the spirit had said, started off nevertheless to the Minotog, 
and there sure enough were the nine girls tied each to a tree as the spirit had said he cut their bonds gave them a lecture took them back to the village and reported to the lord of kishiwada since then the people have feared more than ever the spirit of the one-eyed priest they have become completely reformed an example to the surrounding villages the nine houses or families whose daughters behaved so badly contribute annually the rice eaten by the priests of fudo mayo temple it is spoken of as the nine family rice of oki end of chapter 41 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter 42 of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith the spirit of the lotus lily for some time i have been hunting for a tale about the lotus lily my friend fugua has at last found one which is said to date back some two hundred years it applies to a castle that was then situated in what was known as kenai now incorporated into what may be known as the kyoto district probably it refers to one of the castles in that neighborhood though i myself know of only one which is now called nijo castle fukuga who does not speak english and my interpreter made it very difficult for me to say that the story does not really belong to a castle in the province of izumi for after starting it in kyoto they suddenly brought me to izumi making the hero of it the lord of koriyama in any case i was the first told that disease and sickness broke out in kenai kyoto thousands of people died of it it spread to izumi where the feudal lord of koriyama lived and attacked him also doctors were called from all parts but it was no use the disease spread and to the dismay of all not only the lord of koriyama but also his wife and child were stricken there was a panic terror in the country not that the people feared for themselves but because they were in dread that they might lose their lord and his wife and child the lord koriyama was much beloved people flocked to the castle they camped round its high walls and in its empty moats which were dry there having been no war for some time one day during the illness of the great family tada samon the highest official in the castle next to the lord koriyama himself was sitting in his room thinking what was best to be done on the various questions that were awaiting the daimo's recovery while he was thus engaged a servant announced that there was a visitor at the outer gate who requested an interview saying that he thought he could cure the three sufferers tada samon would see the caller whom the servant shortly after fetched the visitor turned out to be a yama bushi mountain recluse in appearance and on entering the room 
bowed low to salmon saying sir it is an evil business this illness of our lord and master and it has been brought about by an evil spirit who has entered the castle because you have put up no defence against impure and evil spirits this castle is the centre of administration for the whole of the surrounding country and it was unwise to allow it to remain unfortified against impure and evil spirits the saints of old footnote rakan in footnote have always told us to plant the lotus lily not only in the one inner ditch surrounding a castle but also in both ditches or in as many as there be and moreover to plant them all around the ditches surely sir you know that the lotus being the most emblematic flower in our religion must be the most pure and sacred for this reason it drives away uncleanliness which cannot cross it be assured sir that if your lord had not neglected the northern ditches of his castle but had kept them filled with water clean and had planted the sacred lotus no such evil spirit would have come as the present sent by heaven to warn him if i am allowed to do so i shall enter the castle to-day and pray that the evil spirit of sickness leave and i ask that i may be allowed to plant lotuses in the northern moats thus only can the lord of koriyama and his family be saved salmon nodded in answer for he now remembered that the northern moats had neither lotus nor water and that this was partly his fault a matter of economy in connection with the estates he interviewed his master who was more sick than ever he called all the court officials it was decided that the yamabushi should have his way he was told to carry out his ideas as he thought best there was plenty of money and there were hundreds of hands ready to help him everything to save the master the yamabushi washed his body and prayed that the evil spirit of sickness should leave the castle subsequently he superintended the cleansing and repairing of the northern moats directing the people to fill them with water and plant lotuses then he disappeared mysteriously vanished almost before the men's eyes wonderingly but with more energy than ever the men worked to carry out the orders in less than twenty-four hours the moats had been cleaned repaired filled and planted as was to be expected the lord koriyama his wife and son became rapidly better in a week all were able to be up and in a fortnight they were as well as ever they had been thanksgivings were held and there were great rejoicings all over izumi later people flocked to see the splendidly capped moats of lotuses and the villagers went so far as to rename among themselves the castle calling it the lotus castle some years passed before anything strange happened the lord koriyama had died from natural causes and had been succeeded by his son who had neglected the lotus roots a young samurai was passing along one of the moats this was at the end of august when the flowers of the lotus are strong and high the samurai suddenly saw two beautiful boys about six or seven years of age playing at the edge of the moat boys said he 
it is not safe to play so near an edge of the moat come along with me he was about to take them by the hand and lead them off to a safer place when they sprang into the air a little way smiling at him the while and fell into the water where they disappeared with a great splash that covered him with spray so astonished was the samurai he hardly knew what to think for they did not reappear he made sure they must be two kappas mythical animals and with this idea in his mind he ran to the castle and gave information the high officials held a meeting and arranged to have the moats dragged and cleaned they felt that this should have been done when the young lord had succeeded his father the moats were dragged accordingly from end to end but no kappa was found they came to the conclusion that the samurai had been indulging in fancies and he was chaffed in consequence some few weeks later another samurai murata ippi was returning in the evening from visiting his sweetheart and his road led along the outer moat the lotus blossoms were luxuriant and ippi sauntered slowly on admiring them and thinking of his lady love when suddenly he espied a dozen or more of the beautiful little boys playing near the water's edge they had no clothing on and were splashing one another with water ah reflected the samurai these surely are the kappas of which we were told before having taken the form of human beings they think to deceive me a samurai is not frightened by such as they and they will find it difficult to escape the keen edge of my sword ippai cast off his clogs and drawing his sword proceeded stealthily to approach the supposed kappas he approached until he was within some twenty yards then he remained hidden behind a bush and stood for a minute to observe the children continued their play they seemed to be perfectly natural children except that they were all extremely beautiful and from them was wafted a peculiar scent almost powerful but sweet and resembling that of the lotus lily ippai was puzzled and was almost inclined to sheathe his sword on seeing how innocent and unsuspecting the children looked but he thought that he would not be acting up to the determination of a samurai if he changed his mind gripping his sword with renewed vigor therefore he dashed out from his hiding place and slashed right and left among the supposed kappas ippi was convinced that he had done much slaughter for he had felt his sword strike over and over again and had heard the dull thuds of things falling but when he looked about to see what he had killed there arose a peculiar vapor of all colors which almost blinded him by its brilliance it fell in a watery spray all around him ippai determined to wait until the morning for he could not as a samurai leave such an adventure unfinished nor indeed would he have liked to recount it to his friends until he had seen the thing clean through it was a long and dreary wait but ippai was equal to it and never closed his eyes during the night when morning dawned he found nothing but the stalks of lotus lilies sticking up out of the water in his vicinity 
but my sword struck more than lotus stalks thought he if i have not killed the kepas which i saw myself in human form they must have been the spirits of the lotus what terrible sins have i committed it was by the spirits of the lotus that our lord of koriyama and his family were saved from death alas what have i done i a samurai whose every drop of blood belongs to his master i have drawn my sword on my master's most faithful friends i must appease the spirits by disemboweling myself ippai said a prayer and then sitting on a stone by the side of the fallen lotus flowers did harakiri the flowers continued to bloom but after this no more lotus spirits were seen end of chapter forty two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty three of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith the temple of awabi in noto province there is a small fishing village called nanano it is at the extreme northern end of the mainland there is nothing opposite until one reaches either korea or the siberian coast except the small rocky islands which are everywhere in japan surrounding as it were by an outer fringe the land proper of japan itself nano contains not more than five hundred souls many years ago the place was devastated by an earthquake and a terrific storm which between them destroyed nearly the whole village and killed half of the people on the morning after this terrible visitation it was seen that the geographical situation had changed opposite nano some two miles from the land had arisen a rocky island about a mile in circumference the sea was muddy and yellow the people surviving were so overcome and awed that none ventured into a boat for nearly a month afterwards indeed most of the boats had been destroyed being japanese they took things philosophically every one helped some other and within a month the village looked much as it had looked before smaller and less populated perhaps but managing itself unassisted by the outside world indeed all the neighboring villages had suffered much in the same way and after the manner of ants had put things right again the fishermen of nano arranged that their first fishing expedition should be taken together two days before the bon they would first go and inspect the new island and then continue out to sea for a few miles to find if there were still as many thai fish on their favorite ground as there used to be it would be a day of intense interest and the villages of some fifty miles of coast had all decided to make their ventures simultaneously each village trying its own grounds of course but all starting at the same time with a view of eventually reporting to each other the condition of things with regard to fish for mutual assistance in a strong characteristic in the japanese when trouble overcomes them 
at the appointed time two days before the festival the fishermen started from nano there were thirteen boats they visited first the new island which proved to be simply a large rock there were many rock fish such as rassi and sea perch about it but beyond that there was nothing remarkable it had not had time to gather many sea fish on its surface and there was but little edible seaweed as yet so the thirteen boats went farther to sea to discover what had occurred to their old and excellent thai grounds these were found to produce just about what they used to produce in the days before the earthquake but the fishermen were not able to stay long enough to make a thorough test they had meant to be away all night but at dusk the sky gave every appearance of a storm so they pulled up their anchors and made for home as they came close to the new island they were surprised to see on one side of it the water for the space of two hundred and forty feet square lit up with a strange light the light seemed to come from the bottom of the sea and in spite of the darkness the water was transparent the fishermen very much astonished stopped to gaze down into the blue waters they could see fish swimming about in thousands but the depth was too great for them to see the bottom and so they gave rein to all kinds of superstitious ideas as to the cause of the light and talked from one boat to the other about it a few minutes afterwards they had shipped their immense paddling oars and all was quiet then they heard rumbling noises at the bottom of the sea and this filled them with concertation they feared another eruption the oars were put out again and to say that they went fast would in no way convey an idea of the pace that the men made their boats travel over the two miles between the mainland and the island their homes were reached well before the storm came on but the storm lasted for fully two days and the fishermen were unable to leave the shore as the sea calmed down and the villagers were looking out on the third day cause for astonishment came shooting out of the sea near the island rock were rays that seemed to come from a sun in the bottom of the sea all the village congregated on the beach to see this extraordinary spectacle which was discussed far into the night not even the old priests could throw any light on the subject consequently the fishermen became more and more scared and a few of them were ready to venture to sea next day though it was the time for the magnificent sawara king mackerel only one boat left the shore and that belonged to master kansuki a fisherman of some fifty years of age who with his son matakichi a youth of eighteen and a most faithful son was always to the force when anything out of the common had to be done kanasuke had been the acknowledged bold fisherman of nano the leader in all things since most could remember and his faithful and devoted son had followed him from the age of twelve through many perils so that no one was astonished to see their boat leave alone they went first to the thai grounds and fished there during the night catching some thirty odd thai between them the average weight of which would be four pounds towards break of day another storm showed on the horizon 
Kansuke pulled up his anchor and started for home, hoping to take in a hobo line which he had dropped overboard near the rocky island on his way out, a line holding some two hundred hooks. They had reached the island and hauled in nearly the whole line when the rising sea caused Kansuke to lose his balance and fall overboard. Usually the old man would soon have found it an easy matter to scramble back into the boat. On this occasion, however, his head did not appear above water, and so his son jumped in to rescue his father. He dived into water, which almost dazzled him, for bright rays were shooting through it. He could see nothing of his father, but felt that he could not leave him, as the mysterious rays rising from the bottom might have something to do with the accident he made up his mind to follow them they must he thought be reflections from the eye of some monster it was a deep dive and for many minutes madakichi was under water at last he reached the bottom and here he found an enormous colony of the awabi ear shells the space covered by them was fully two hundred square feet and in the middle of all was one of gigantic size the like of which he had never heard of from the holes at the top through which the feelers pass shot the bright rays which illuminated the sea rays which are said by the japanese divers to show the presence of a pearl the pearl in this shell thought madakichi the pearl in this shell thought madakichi must be one of enormous size as large as a baby's head from all the awabi shells on the patch he could see the lights that lights were coming which denoted that they contained pearls but wherever he looked madakichi could see nothing of his father he thought his father must have been drowned and if so that the best thing for him to do would be to regain the surface and repair to the village to report his father's death and also his wonderful discovery which would be of such value to the people of nano having after much difficulty reached the surface he to his dismay found the boat broken by the sea which was now high madakichi was lucky however he saw a bit of floating wreckage which he seized and as sea wind and current helped him strong swimmer as he was it was not more than half an hour before he was ashore relating to the villagers the adventures of the day his discoveries and the loss of his dear father the fishermen could hardly credit the news that what they had taken to be supernatural lights were caused by ear shells for the much-valued ear shell was extremely rare about their district but madakichi was a youth of such trustworthiness that even the most skeptical believed him in the end and had it not been for the loss of kansuke there would have been great rejoicing in the village that evening having told the villagers the news madakichi repaired to the old priest's house at the end of the village and told him also and now that my beloved father is dead said he i myself beg that you will make me one of your disciples so that i may pray daily for my father's spirit the old priest followed madakichi's wish and said not only shall i be glad to have so brave and filial 
a youth as yourself as a disciple but also i myself would pray with you for your father's spirit and on the twenty-first day from his death we will take boats and pray over the spot at which he was drowned accordingly on the morning of the twenty-first day after the drowning of poor kansuke his son and the priest were anchored over the place where he had been lost and prayers for the spirit of the dead were said that same night the priest awoke at midnight he felt ill at ease and thought much of the spiritual affairs of his flock suddenly he saw an old man standing near the head of his couch who bowed courteously and said i am the spirit of the great earshell lying on the bottom of the sea near rocky island my age is over one thousand years some days ago a fisherman fell from his boat into the sea and i killed and ate him this morning i heard your reverence praying over the place where i lay with the son of the man i ate your sacred prayers have taught me shame and i sorrow for the thing i have done by way of atonement i have ordered my followers to scatter themselves while i have determined to kill myself so that the pearls that are in my shell may be given to matakichi the son of the man i ate all i ask is that you should pray for my spirit's welfare farewell saying which the ghost of the ear shell vanished early next morning when matakichi opened his shutters to dust the front of his door he found thereat what he took at first to be a large rock covered with seaweed and even with pink coral on closer examination matakichi found it to be the immense ear shell which he had seen at the bottom of the sea off rocky island he rushed off to the temple to tell the priest who told matakichi of his visitation during the night the shell and the body contained therein were carried to the temple with every respect and much ceremony prayers were said over it and though the shell and the immense pearl were kept in the temple the body was buried in a tomb next to kansuke's with a monument erected over it and another over kansuke's grave madachichi changed his name to that of nichigi and lived happily there have been no ear shells seen near nano since but on the rocky island is erected a shrine to the spirit of the ear shell note a three thousand yen pearl which i know of was sold for twelve cents by a fisherman from the west it came from a temple belongs now to mikomotu and is this size end of chapter forty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty four of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith human fireflies in funakami mura omi province lived an old farmer called kanshiro the like of him for honesty charity and piety had never been known no not even among the priesthood annually kanshiro made pilgrimages to various parts of the country to say his prayers and do his duty towards the various deities never thinking of his old age or of his infirmities 
he was not strong, and suffered almost always from dysentery during the hot weather. Consequently, he usually made his pilgrimages in cooler times. In the eighth year of Kwansei, however, Kanshiro felt that he could not live another year, and, feeling that he should not like to miss making another pilgrimage to the great shrines at Ise, he resolved to take all risks and go in August, the hottest month. The people in Funakami village subscribed 100 yen for the venerable man so that he might have the honour and credit of presenting a decent sum to the great shrines. On a certain day, therefore, Kanshiro started alone, with the money hung in a bag about his neck. He had walked from sunrise to sunset for two days, when on the third, in great heat, he arrived at the village of Myojo, feeling nearly dead with weakness, for he had another attack of his old complaint. Kanshiro felt that he could not continue his journey while this lasted, especially as he considered himself in an unclean condition, unfit to carry the holy money which had been entrusted to him by his friends in Funakami. He went accordingly to the cheapest inn he could find, and confided both his story and the hundred yen to the landlord, saying, "'Sir, I am an old man, sick with dysentery. If you will take care of me for a day or two, I shall be better.' Keep also until I am well this sacred money, for it would not do for me to defile it by carrying it with me while I am unwell. Jinpachi, the innkeeper, bowed, and gave every assurance that Kanshido's wish should be followed. Fear nothing, said he. I will place the money in its bag in a safe place, and myself attend upon you until you are well, for such good men as you are rare. For five days the poor old man was very sick indeed, but with his indomitable pluck he recovered, and on the sixth day decided to start again. It was a fine day. Kanshiro paid his bill, thanked the landlord for his kindness, and was handed over his money bag at the door. He did not look into the bag, because there were many coolies and pilgrims about. He did not wish these strangers to see that he carried much money. Instead of hanging it about his neck, as he had done before, he put the bag into his sack of clothing and food, and started off. Towards midday, Kanshido stopped to rest and eat his cold rice under a pine tree. On examining his bag, he found the hundred yen gone, and stones of the same weight placed in it instead. The poor man was greatly disconcerted. He did not even wait to eat his rice, but started back to the inn, which he reached at dusk. He explained as best he could the facts to Jimpachi, the innkeeper. At first this worthy listened to the story with some sympathy, but when Kanshido begged him to return the money, he flew into a rage. "'You old rascal,' said he. "'A nice story you're telling to try and blackmail me. I'll give you a lesson that you'll not forget.' and with that he struck the old man a severe blow on the chest, and then, seizing a stick, beat him unmercifully. The coolies joined in, and thrashed him until he was nearly dead. Poor old fellow! What could he do? Alone as he was, he crawled away half dead, but he got to the sacred Ise shrines three days later, and after saying his prayers, started back to Funakami. Here he arrived seriously ill. On telling his story, some believed him, but others did not. So overcome with grief was he, he sold his small property to refund the money, and with the rest he continued his pilgrimages to various temples and shrines. At last, all his money was gone, but even then he continued his pilgrimages, begging food as he went. Three years later he again visited Myojo village on his way to Ise, and here he learned that his enemy had since made a good deal of money, and now lived in quite a good house. Kanshido went and found him, and said, Three years ago you stole the money entrusted to me. 
I sold my property to refund the people what they'd given me to take to Ise. I have been a beggar and a wanderer ever since. Think not that I shall not be avenged. I shall be. You are young, I am old. Vengeance will overtake you soon. Jimpachi still protested innocence and began to get angry, saying, You disreputable old blackguard! If you want a meal of rice, say so, but do not dare to threaten me. At this moment, the watchman on his rounds took Kanshido for a real beggar, and, seizing him by the arm, dragged him to the end of the village, and ordered him not to re-enter it on pain of arrest, and there the poor old man died of anger and weakness. The good priest of the neighbouring temple took the body and buried it with respect, saying prayers. Jimpachi, in the meantime, afflicted with a guilty conscience, became sick, until after a few days he was unable to leave his bed. After he had lost all power of movement, a curious thing occurred. Thousands and thousands of fireflies came out of Kanshiro's tomb and flew to the bedroom of Jimpachi. They surrounded his mosquito curtain and tried to force their way in. The top of the curtain was pressed down with them, the air was foul with them, the glimmer dazzled the sick man's eyes, no rest was possible. The villagers came in to try and kill them, but they could make no impression, for the string of flies from Kanshido's tomb continued as fast as others were killed. The fireflies went nowhere else than to Jimpachi's room, and there they only surrounded his bed. One or two villagers, seeing this, said, It must be true that Jimpachi stole the money from the old man, and that this is his spirit's revenge. Then everyone feared to kill the flies. Thicker and thicker they grew, until they did at last make a hole in the mosquito net, and then they settled all over Jimpachi. They got in his mouth, his nose, his ears, and his eyes. He kicked and screamed, and lived thus in agony for twenty days, and after his death the flies disappeared completely. End of chapter 44 Recording by Rob Marland Chapter 45 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith The Chrysanthemum Hermit Many years ago there lived at the foot of the mountains of Nambu, in Adachigan, Saitama Prefecture, an old man named Kikuo, which means Chrysanthemum Old Man. Kikuo was a faithful retainer of Tsugaru. He was then called Sawada Hayato. Kikuo was a man of great bodily strength and fine appearance, and had much to do with the efficiency of the small fighting force which protected the feudal lord, the castle, and the estates. Nevertheless, an evil day came. The feudal lord's small force was overthrown, the estates and castle were lost. The lord and his faithful retainer, with the few survivors, escaped to the mountains where they continued to think that a day might come when they would be able to have their revenge. During the enforced idleness, Kikuo, knowing his lord's love of flowers, especially of the chrysanthemum, made his mind up to devote all his spare time to making chrysanthemum beds. This, he thought, would lessen the pain of defeat and exile. The feudal lord was greatly pleased, but his cares and anxieties were not abated. He sickened and died in great poverty, much to the sorrow of Kikuo and the rest of his followers. Kikuo wept night and day over the humble and lonely grave, but he busied himself again to please the spirit of his lord by planting chrysanthemums round the tomb and tending them daily. By and by the border of the flowers was thirty yards broad, to the wonder of all who saw. It was because of that 
Hayato got the name of Chrysanthemum Old Man. The chrysanthemum is in China a holy flower. Ancient history tells of a man called Hoso, great-grandson of the Emperor Juikai, who lived to the age of 800 years without showing the slightest sign of decay. This was attributed to his drinking the dew of the chrysanthemum. Besides his devotion to flowers, Kikuru delighted in children. From the village he called them to his poor hut, and as there was no schoolmaster he taught them to write, to read, and jujitsu. The children loved him, and the good villagers revered him as if he were a kind of a god. In about his eighty-second year, Kikuo caught cold, and the fever which came with it gave him great pain. During the daytime, his pupils attended to his wants, but at night the old man was alone in his cottage. One autumn night he awoke and found standing about his veranda some beautiful children. They did not look quite like any children he knew. They were too beautiful and noble-looking to be the poor of the village. Kiko Osama, cried two of them, do not fear us, though we are not real children. We are the spirits of the chrysanthemum which you love so much, and of which you have taken such care. We have come to tell you how sorry we are to see you ill, although we have heard that in China there once lived a man called Hoso who lived for eight hundred years by drinking the dew which falls from the flowers. We have tried all we can to prolong your life, but we find that the heavens do not allow that you should live to a much greater age than you have already reached. In thirty days more you will die. Make ready, therefore, to depart." Saying this, they all wept bitterly. "'Good-bye, then,' said Kikuo. "'I have no further hopes of living. Let my death be easy. In the next world I may be able to serve my old lord and master. The only thing that makes me sad to leave this world is you. I must forever regret to leave my chrysanthemums.' Saying this, he smiled at them in affection. "'You have been very kind to us,' said the Kiku spirits, "'and we love you for it. Man rejoices at birth and feels sad at death, yet now you shed no tears. You say you do not mind dying except for leaving us. If you die, we shall not survive, for it would be useless misery. Believe us when we say that we shall die with you.' As the spirits of the chrysanthemums finished speaking, a puff of wind came about the house and they disappeared. As the day dawned, the old man grew worse, and strange to say, all the chrysanthemums began to fade. Even those which were just beginning to bloom, the leaves crumbled up and dried. As the spirits had foretold, at the end of the thirtieth day the old man died. The Kiku flowers died then. Not one was left in the whole district. The villagers could not account for it. They buried the old man near his lord, and, thinking to honor and please him, planted, time after time, chrysanthemums near his grave. But all faded and died as soon as they were planted. The two little graves were at last given up, and they remain in their solitude, with wild grasses only growing about them. End of chapter 45。Chapter 46 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith The Princess Peony Many years ago at Gamogun in the province of Omi was a castle called Adzuchi no Shiro. It was a magnificent old place, surrounded by walls and a moat filled with lotus lilies. The feudal lord was a very brave and wealthy man, Yuki Naizen no Jo. His wife had been dead for some years. 
he had no son but he had a beautiful daughter aged eighteen who for some reason which is not quite clear to me was given the title of princess for a considerable period there had been peace and quiet in the land the feudal lords were on the best of terms and every one was happy amid these circumstances lord nizen no jo perceived that there was a good opportunity to find a husband for his daughter princess aya and after a time the second son of the lord of ako of harima province was selected to the satisfaction of both fathers the affair having little to do with the principles lord ako's son had viewed his bride with approval and she him one may say that young people are bound to approve each other when it is the parents wish that they be united many suicides result from this princess aya made her mind up to try and love her prospective husband she saw nothing of him but she thought of him and talked of him one evening when princess aya was walking in the magnificent gardens by the moonlight accompanied by her maids in waiting she wandered down through her favorite peony bed to the pond where she loved to gaze at her reflection on the nights of the full moon to listen to frogs and to watch the fireflies when nearing the pond her foot slipped and she would have fallen into the water had it not been that a young man appeared as if by magic and caught her he disappeared as soon as he put her on her feet again the maids of honor saw her slip they saw a glimmer of light and that was all but princess aya had seen more she had seen the handsomest young man she could imagine twenty-one years old she said to o sado san her favorite maid he must have been a samurai of the highest order his dress was covered with my favorite peonies and his swords were richly mounted oh that i could have seen him a minute longer to thank him for saving me from the water who can he be and how could he have got into our garden through all the guards so spoke the princess to her maids directing them at the same time that they were to say a word to no one for fear that her father should hear find the young man and behead him for trespass after this evening princess aya fell sick she could not eat or sleep and turned pale the day for her marriage with the young lord of aku came and went without the event she was far too sick for that the best of the doctors had been sent from kyoto which was then the capital but none of them had been able to do anything and the maid grew thinner and thinner as a last resort the lord nizen no jo her father sent for her most confidential maid and friend o sadayo and demanded if she could give any reason for his daughter's mysterious sickness had she a secret lover had she a particular dislike for her betrothed sir said o sadayo i do not like to tell secrets but here it seems my duty to your lordship's daughter as well as to your lordship some three weeks ago when the moon was at its full we were walking in the peony beds down near the pond where the princess loves to be she stumbled and nearly fell into the water when a strange thing happened in an instant a most beautiful young samurai appeared and held her up thus preventing her from falling into the pond 
we could all see the glimmer of him but your daughter and i saw him most distinctly before your daughter could thank him he had disappeared none of us could understand how it was possible for a man to get into the gardens of the princess for the gates of the castle are guarded on all sides and the princess's garden is so much better guarded than the rest that it seems truly incredible that a man could get in we maids were asked to say nothing for fear of your lordship's anger since that evening it is that our beloved princess aya has been sick sir it is sickness of the heart she is deeply in love with the young samurai she saw for so brief a space indeed my lord there never was such a handsome man in the world before and if we cannot find him the young princess i fear will die how is it possible for a man to get into the grounds said lord yuki nazan no jo people say foxes and badgers assume the figures of men sometimes but even so it is possible for such supernatural beings to enter my castle grounds guarded as it is at every opening that evening the poor princess was more wearily unhappy than ever before thinking to enliven her a little the maid sent for a celebrated player on the biwa called yashika kenjo the weather being hot they were sitting on the gallery and gawa and while the musician was playing danarora there appeared suddenly from behind the peonies the same handsome young samurai he was visible to all this time even to the peonies embroidered on his dress there he is there he is they cried at which he instantly disappeared again the princess was highly excited and seemed more lively than she had been for days the old daimo grew more puzzled than ever when he heard of it next night while two of the maids were playing for their mistress o ye san the flute and o yakumo the koto the figure of the young man appeared again a thorough search having been made during the day in the immense peony beds was absolutely no result not even the sign of a footmark the thing was increasingly strange a consultation was held and it was decided by the lord of the castle to invite a veteran officer of great strength and renown maki higo to capture the youth should he appear that evening maki higo readily consented and at the appointed time dressed in black and consequently invisible concealed himself among the peonies music seemed to have a fascination for the young samurai it was while music was being played that he made his appearances consequently o ye and yukumo resumed their concert while all gazed eagerly towards the peony beds as the ladies played a piece called sophurin there sure enough arose the figure of a young samurai dressed magnificently in clothes which were covered with embroidered peonies everyone gazed at him and wondered why maki hugo did not jump up and catch him the fact was that maki hugo was so much astonished by the noble bearing of the youth that at first he did not like to touch him recovering himself and thinking of his duty to his lord he stealthily approached the young man and seizing him round the waist held him tight after a few seconds maki hiogo felt a kind of wet steam 
falling on his face by degrees it made him faint and he fell to the ground still grasping the young samurai for he had made up his mind that he would secure him every one had seen the scuffle and some of the guards came hurrying to the place just as they reached the spot maki hugo came to his senses and shouted come gentlemen i have caught him come and see but on looking at what he held in his arms he discovered it to be only a large peony by this time the lord nasin no jo had arrived at the spot where maki hugo lay and so had the princess awa and her maids all were astonished and mystified except the daimo himself who said ah it is as i said no fox or badger spirit could pass our guards and get into this garden it is the spirit of the peony flower that took the form of a prince turning to his daughter and her maids he said you must take this as a compliment and pay great respect to the peony and show the one caught by maki hugo kindness as well by taking care of it the princess aya carried the flower back to her room where she put it in a vase of water and placed it near her pillow she felt as if she had her sweetheart with her day by day she got better she tended the peony herself and strange to say the flower seemed to get stronger and stronger instead of fading at last the princess recovered she became radiantly beautiful while the peony continued to remain in perfect bloom showing no sign of dying the princess Aya being now perfectly well her father could no longer put off the wedding consequently some days later the lord of akko and his family arrived at the castle and his second son was married to the princess as soon as the wedding was over the peony was found still in its vase but dead and withered the villagers always after this instead of speaking of the princess Aya or Aya himi called her botan himi or peony princess end of chapter forty six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty seven of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith the memorial cherry tree footnote this story begins on the seventeenth of february in the second year of kenku as the first year of kenku was in eleven ninety and the last in eleven ninety nine the precise date is february seventeenth eleven ninety two in footnote in the compound or enclosure of the temple called bukoji at tadatsui high cross street formerly called yabugashita which means under the bush in kyoto a curio dealer had his little shop his name was kihachi kihachi had not much to sell but what little he had was usually good consequently his was a place that the better people looked into when they came to pray to see if not to buy 
for they knew full well if there was a good thing to be bought kihachi bought it it was a small and ancient kind of christie's in fact except that things were not sold by auction one day the day on which this story starts kihachi was sitting in his shop ready either to gossip or sell when in walked a young knight or court noble kuji the japanese called him in those days and very different was such an one from a knight of a feudal lord or of a daimo who was usually a blusterer this particular knight had been to the temple to pray you have many pretty and interesting things here said he may i come in and look at them until this shower of rain has passed my name is sakata and i belong to the court come in come in said kihachi by all means some of my things are pretty and all are undoubtedly good but the gentry part with little at present one wants to live two lives of a hundred years each in my trade one hundred of distress revolution and trouble wherein one may collect the things cheap and the next hundred of peace wherein one may sell them and enjoy the proceeds my business is rotten and unprofitable yet in spite of that i love the things i buy and often look at them long before i put them up for sale where sir are you bound for i see that you are going to travel by the clothes you wear and carry that's true answered sakata you are very shrewd i am going to travel as far as toba in yamato to see my dearest friend who has been taken suddenly and mysteriously ill it is feared he may not live until i get there at toba answered the old curio dealer pardon me if i ask the name of your friend certainly said sakata my friend's name is matsui then said the curio dealer he is the gentleman who is said to have killed the ghost or spirit of the old cherry tree near toba going in the grounds of the temple in which he lives at present with the priests the people say that this cherry tree is so old that the spirit left it it appeared in the form of a beautiful woman and matsui either fearing or not liking it killed it with the result they say that from that very evening which was about ten days ago your friend matsui has been sick and i may add that when the spirit was killed the tree withered and died sakata thanking kiachi for this information went on his way and eventually found his friend matsui being carefully nursed by the priest of the shoen temple toba with whom he was closely connected soon after the young knight had left the old curio dealer kiachi in his shop it began to snow and so it continued and appeared likely to continue for some time kiachi therefore put up his shutters and retired to bed as is often very sensibly done in japan and he no doubt retired with many old wood carvings to rub and give an ancient appearance too during the period of darkness not very late in the evening there was a knock at the shutters kiachi not wishing to get out of his warm bed shouted who are you come back in the morning i do not feel well enough to get up to-night but you must you must get up i am sent to sell you a good 
kakimono called the voice of a young girl so sweetly and entreatingly that the old curio dealer got up and after much fumbling with his numbed fingers opened the door snow had fallen thickly but now it was clear moonlight and kiachi saw standing before him a beautiful girl of fifteen barefooted and holding in her hands a kakimono half unfolded see said she i have been sent to sell you this she was the daughter of matsui of toba she said the old man called her in and saw that the picture was that of a beautiful woman standing up it was well done and the old man took a fancy to it i will give you one rio for it said he and to his astonishment the young girl accepted his offer eagerly so much so that he thought that perhaps she had stolen it being a curio dealer he said nothing on the point but paid her the money she ran away with haste yes she has stolen it stolen it undoubtedly muttered the old man but what am i supposed to know about that the kakimono is worth fully fifty rio if it is worth a cent and not often do such chances come to me so delighted was kihachi with his purchase he lit his lamp hung the picture in his kakimono corner and sat watching it it was indeed a beautiful woman well painted and worth more even than the fifty rio he at first thought but by all the saints it seems to change yes it is no longer a beautiful woman the face has changed to that of a fearful and horrible figure the face of the woman has become haggard it is covered with blood the eyes open and shut and the mouth gasps kihachi feels blood dropping on his head it comes from a wound in the woman's shoulder to shut out so horrid a sight he put his head under the bedclothes and remained thus sleeplessly until dawn when he opened his eyes the kakimono was the same as when he had bought it a beautiful woman he supposed that his delight in having made a good bargain must have been made in dream so he thought nothing more about the horror kiachi however was mistaken the kakimono again kept him awake all night showing the same bloody face and occasionally even shrieking kiachi got no sleep and perceived that instead of a cheap bargain he had got a very expensive one for he felt that he must go to toba and return it to matsui and he knew that he could claim no expenses after fully two days of travel kihachi reached the shoen temple near toba where he asked to see matsui he was ushered ceremoniously into his room the invalid was better but on being handed the kakimono with the figure of the lady painted on it he turned pale tore it to fragments and threw it into the temple fire iori footnote the story says furnace but unless cremation went on in those days it must have been the inori open floor fire or else if a shinto temple an open air bonfire which is lit on certain days in footnote after which he jumped in with his daughter himself and both were burned to death kihachi was sick 
for many days after this sight the story soon spread over the whole surrounding country prince nijo governor of kyoto had a thorough inquiry made into the circumstances of the case and it was found beyond doubt that the trouble to matsui and his family came through his having killed the spirit of the old cherry tree the spirit to punish him and show that there was invisible life in old and dead things and often of the best appeared to matsui as a beautiful woman being killed the spirit went into his beautiful picture and haunted him prince nijo had a fine cherry tree planted on the spot of the old to commemorate the event and it is called the memorial cherry tree to this day end of chapter 47 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter 48 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David McKay. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. The Jirohei Cherry Tree, Kyoto. The Japanese say that ghosts in inanimate nature generally have more liveliness than ghosts of the dead. There is an old proverb which says something to the effect that the ghosts of trees love not the willow, by which I suppose is meant that they do not assimilate. In Japanese pictures of ghosts, there is nearly always a willow tree. Whether Hokusai, the ancient painter, or Okyo Maruyama, a famous painter of Kyoto of more recent date, was responsible for the pictures with ghosts and willow trees, I do not know. But certainly Maruyama painted many ghosts under willow trees, the first from his wife, who lay sick. Exactly what this has to do with the following story, I cannot see. But my storyteller began with it. In the northern part of Kyoto is a Shinto temple called Hirano. It is celebrated for the fine cherry trees that grow there. Among them is an old dead tree which is called Jirohei, and is much cared for. But the story attached to it is little known, and has not been told, I believe, to a European before. During the cherry blossom season, many people go to view the trees, especially at night. Close to the Jirohei cherry tree, many years ago, was a large and prosperous tea house, once owned by Jirohei, who had started in quite a small way. So rapidly did he make money, he attributed his success to the virtue of the old cherry tree, which he accordingly venerated. Jirohei paid the greatest respect to the tree, attending to its wants. He prevented boys from climbing it and breaking its branches. The tree prospered, and so did he. One morning a samurai, of the blood and thunder kind, walked up to the Hirano temple and sat down at Jirohei's tea house to take a long look at the cherry blossom. He was a powerful, dark-skinned, evil-faced man, about five feet eight in height. "'Are you the landlord of this tea-house?' asked he. "'Yes, sir,' Jirohei answered meekly. "'I am. What can I bring you, sir?' "'Nothing, I thank you,' said the samurai. "'What a fine tree you have here opposite your tea-house.' "'Yes, sir, it is to the fineness of the tree that I owe my prosperity. "'Thank you, sir, for expressing your appreciation of it.' I want a branch off the tree, quoth the samurai, for a geisha. Deeply as I regret it, I am obliged to refuse your request. I must refuse everybody. The temple priests gave orders to this effect before they let me erect this place. No matter who it may be that asks, I must refuse. Flowers may not even be picked off the tree, though they may be gathered when they fall. Please, sir, remember that there is an old proverb which tells us to cut the plum tree for our vases, but not the cherry. You seem to be an unpleasantly argumentative person for your station in life, said the samurai. 
When I say that I want a thing, I mean to have it. So you had better go and cut it. However much you may be determined, I must refuse, said Jirohei quietly and politely. And however much you may refuse, the more determined am I to have it. I, as a samurai, said I should have it. Do you think that you can turn me from my purpose? If you have not the politeness to get it, I will take it by force. Suiting his action to his words, the samurai drew a sword about three feet long and was about to cut off the best branch of all. Jirohei clung to the sleeve of his sword arm, crying, I have asked you to leave the tree alone, but you would not. Please, take my life instead. You are an insolent and annoying fool. I gladly follow your request. And saying this, the samurai stabbed Jirohei slightly to make him let go the sleeve. Jirohei did let go, but he ran to the tree, where in a further struggle over the branch, which was cut in spite of Jirohei's defense, he was stabbed again, this time fatally. The samurai, seeing that the man must die, got away as quickly as possible, leaving the cut branch in full bloom on the ground. Hearing the noise, the servants came out of the house, followed by Jirohei's poor old wife. It was seen that Jirohei himself was dead, but he clung to the tree as firmly as in life, and it was fully an hour before they were able to get him away. From this time, things went badly with the tea house. Very few people came, and such as did come were poor and spent but little money. Besides, from the day of the murder of Jirohei, the tree had begun to fade and die. In less than a year, it was absolutely dead. The tea house had to be closed for want of funds to keep it open. The old wife of Jirohei had hanged herself on the dead tree a few days after her husband had been killed. People said that ghosts had been seen about the tree and were afraid to go there at night. Even neighboring tea houses suffered, and so did the temple, which for a time became unpopular. The samurai, who had been the cause of all this, kept his secret, telling no one but his own father what he had done, and he expressed to his father his intention of going to the temple to verify the statements about the ghosts. Thus, on the third day of March in the third year of Keio, that is, forty-two years ago, he started one night alone and well-armed, in spite of his father's attempts to stop him. He went straight to the old dead tree and hid himself behind a stone lantern. To his astonishment, at midnight the dead tree suddenly came out into full bloom, and looked just as it had been when he cut the branch and killed Jirohei. On seeing this, he fiercely attacked the tree with his keen-edged sword. He attacked it with mad fury, cutting and slashing, and he heard a fearful scream which seemed to him to come from inside the tree. After half an hour he became exhausted but resolved to wait until daybreak to see what damage he had wrought. When day dawned, the samurai found his father lying on the ground, hacked to pieces, and, of course, dead. Doubtless the father had followed to try and see that no harm came to the son. The samurai was stricken with grief and shame. Nothing was left but to go and pray to the gods for forgiveness and to offer his life to them, which he did by disemboweling himself. From that day, the ghost appeared no more, and people came as before to view the cherry bloom by night as well as by day, so they do even now. No one has ever been able to say whether the ghost which appeared was the ghost of Jirohei, or that of his wife, or that of the cherry tree which had died when its limb had been severed. End of chapter 48 Recording by David McKay Chapter 49 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. The Snow Ghost. Perhaps there are not many, even in Japan, who have heard of the Yuki Ona, Snow Ghost. It is little spoken of, except in the higher mountains, which are continually snow-clad in the winter. 
Those who have read Lafcadio Hearn's books will remember a story of the Yukiona, made much of on account of its beautiful telling, but in reality not better than the following. Up in the northern province of Ekigo, opposite Sado Island on the Japan Sea, snow falls heavily. Sometimes there is as much as twenty feet of it on the ground, and many are the people who have been buried in the snows and never found until spring. Not many years ago, three companies of soldiers, with the exception of three or four men, were destroyed in Eowomori, and it was many weeks before they were dug out, dead of course. Mysterious disappearances naturally give rise to fancies in a fanciful people, and from time immemorial the snow ghost has been one with the people of the north, while those of the south say that those of the north take so much sake that they see snow-covered trees as women. Be that as it may, I must explain what a farmer called Kyozimon saw. In the village of Hoi, which consisted only of eleven houses, very poor ones at that, lived Kyozimon. He was poor, and doubly unfortunate in having lost both his son and his wife. He led a lonely life. In the afternoon on the 19th of January of the third year of Tempo, that is 1833, a tremendous snowstorm came on. Yuzimon closed the shutters and made himself as comfortable as he could. Towards eleven o'clock at night he was awakened by a rapping at his door. It was a peculiar rap, and came at regular intervals. Yuzimon sat up in bed, looked towards the door, and did not know what to think of this. The rapping came again, and with it the gentle voice of a girl. Thinking that it might be one of his neighbor's children wanting help, Kyozimon jumped out of bed, but when he got to the door he feared to open it. Voice and rapping coming again just as he reached it, he sprang back with a cry, "'Who are you? What do you want?' "'Open the door! Open the door!' came the voice from outside. "'Open the door! Is that likely until I know who you are and what you are doing out so late and on such a night? "'But you must let me in. How can I proceed farther in this deep snow? I do not ask for food, but only for shelter. "'I am very sorry, but I have no quilts or bedding. I can't possibly let you stay in my house. "'I don't want quilts or bedding, only shelter,' pleaded the voice. "'I can't let you in any way.' shouted Kyozimon. It is too late and against the rules and the law. Saying which, Kyozimon rebarred his door with a strong piece of wood, never once having ventured to open a crack in the shutters to see who his visitor might be. As he turned towards his bed, with a shudder he beheld the figure of a woman standing beside it, clad in white, with her hair down her back. She had not the appearance of a ghost, her face was pretty, and she seemed to be about twenty-five years of age. Kiyuzimon, taken by surprise and very much alarmed, called out, "'Who and what are you, and how did you get in? Where did you leave your geta?' "'I can come in anywhere when I choose,' said the figure, "'and I am the woman who you would not let in. I require no clogs, for I whirl along over the snow.' sometimes even flying through the air. I am on my way to visit the next village, but the wind is against me. That is why I wanted you to let me rest here. If you will do so, I shall start as soon as the wind goes down. In any case, I shall be gone by morning. I should not so much mind letting you rest if you were an ordinary woman. I should, in fact, be glad, but I fear spirits greatly, as my forefathers have done said Kiyuzimon. "'Be not afraid. You have a Butsudan?' said the figure. "'Yes, I have a Butsudan,' said Kiyuzimon. "'But what can you want to do with that? You say you are afraid of the spirits, of the effect that I may have upon you. I wish to pay my respects to your ancestors' tablets, 
and assure their spirits that no ill shall befall you through me. Will you open and light the Butsudan? Yes, said Kyuzimon, with fear and trembling. I will open the Butsudan and light the lamp. Please pray for me as well, for I am an unfortunate and unlucky man. But you must tell me in return who and what spirit you are. You want to know much, but I will tell you, said the spirit. I believe you are a good man. My name is Oyasu. I am the daughter of Yaziman, who lives in the next village. My father, as perhaps you may have heard, is a farmer, and he adopted into his family, and as a husband for his daughter, Isiburo. Isiburo is a good man, but on the death of his wife last year he forsook his father-in-law and went back to his old home. It is principally for that reason that I am about to seek and remonstrate with him now. Am I to understand, said Kiyosiman, that the daughter who was married to Isiburo is the one who perished in the snow last year? If so, you must be the spirit of Oyasu, or Isiburo's wife? Yes, that is right, said the spirit. I was Oyasu, the wife of Isiburo who perished now a year ago in the great snowstorm, of which tomorrow will be the anniversary. Kiyosimon, with trembling hands, lit the lamp in the little Butsudan, mumbling, Namu Amida Butsu, Namu Amida Butsu, with a fervor which he had never felt before. When this was done, he saw the figure of the Yukiona, the snow spirit, advance, but there was no sound of footsteps as she glided to the altar. Kiyosimon retired to bed, where he promptly fell asleep. But shortly afterwards he was disturbed by the voice of the woman, bidding him farewell. Before he had time to sit up, she disappeared, leaving no sign. The fire still burned in the Butsudan. Kiyosimon got up at daybreak and went to the next village to see Isiburo whom he found living with his father-in-law, Yezimon. Yes, said Isiburo, it was wrong of me to leave my late wife's father when she died. I am not surprised that on cold nights when it snows I have been visited continually by my wife's spirit as a reproof. Early this morning I saw her again, and I resolved to return. I have only been here two hours as it is. On comparing notes, Kyozimon and Ishiburo found that directly the spirit of Oyasu had left the house of Kyozimon, she appeared to Ishiburo at about half an hour after midnight, and stayed with him until he had promised to return to her father's house and help him to live in his old age. That is roughly my story of the Yukiona. All those who die by the snow and cold become spirits of snow appearing when there is snow, just as the spirits of those who are drowned in the sea only appear in stormy seas. Even to the present day, in the north, priests say prayers to appease the spirits of those who have died by snow, and to prevent them from haunting people who are connected with them. End of chapter 49「Chapter fifty of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan」。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Melodia Carey. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. The Snow Tomb。Footnote。Told to me by Fukuchi in connection with the firelights in foxes. Carefully translated by Mr. Watanabe of the Prefectural Government. End of footnote. Many years ago, there lived a young man of the samurai class who was much famed for his skill in fencing in what was called the style of Yagyu. So adept was he, he earned by teaching under his master no less than thirty barrels of rice and two rations, which, I am told, vary from one to five show a month. As one show is point six 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 feet square, our young samurai, Rokugo Yakeji, was well off.
The seat of his success was at Minamiwari Gesui, Hongo Yedo. His teacher was Sudo Jiro Zaemon, and the school was at Ishiwaraku. Rokugo was in no way proud of his skill. It was the modesty of the youth, coupled with cleverness, that had prompted the teacher to make his pupil an assistant master. The school was one of the best in Tokyo, and there were over 100 pupils. One January, the pupils were assembled to celebrate the new year, and on this, the seventh day of it, were drinking nanakusa, a kind of sloppy rice in which seven grasses and green vegetables are mixed, said to keep off all diseases for the year. The pupils were engaged in ghost stories, each trying to tell a more alarming one than his neighbor, until the hair of many was practically on end, and it was late in the evening. It was the custom to keep the 7th of January in this way, and they took their turns by drawing numbers. One hundred candles were placed in a shed at the end of the garden, and each teller of a story took his turn at bringing one away, until they had all told a story. This was to upset if possible the bragging of the pupil who said he did not believe in ghosts and feared nothing at last it came to the turn of rakugo after fetching his candle from the end of the garden he spoke as follows my friends listen to my story it is not very dreadful but it is true some three years ago when i was seventeen my father sent me to gifu in mino province I reached on the way a place called Nakimura about ten o'clock in the evening. Outside the village, on some wild, uncultivated land, I saw a curious fireball. It moved here and there without noise, came quite close to me, and then went away again, moving generally as if looking for something. It went round and round over the same ground time after time. It was generally five feet off the ground, but sometimes it went lower. I will not say that I was frightened, because subsequently I went to the Miyoshia Inn and to bed, without mentioning what I had seen to anyone. But I can assure you all that I was very glad to be in the house. Next morning, my curiosity got the better of me. I told the landlord what I had seen, and he recounted to me a story. He said, About two hundred years ago, a great battle was fought here, and the general who was defeated was himself killed. When his body was recovered early in the action, it was found to be headless. The soldiers thought that a head must have been stolen by the enemy. One, more anxious than the rest to find his master's head, continued to search while the action went on. While searching, he himself was killed. Since that evening, two hundred years ago, the fireball has been burning after ten o'clock. The people from that time till now have called it Kubi Sagashi no Hi, footnote, the head-seeking fire, end of footnote. As the master of the inn finished relating this story, my friends, I felt an unpleasant sensation in the heart. It was the first thing of a ghostly kind that I had seen. The pupils agreed that the story was strange. Rokugo pushed his toes into his geta clogs and started to fetch his candle from the end of the garden. He had not proceeded far into the garden before he heard the voice of a woman. It was not very dark, as there was snow on the ground, but Rokugo could see no woman. He had got as far as the candles when he heard the voice again and, turning suddenly, saw a beautiful woman of some eighteen summers. Her clothes were fine. The obi, belt, was tied in the tateyano jiri shape of the arrow standing erect as an arrow in a quiver the dress was all of the pine and bamboo pattern and her hair was done in the shimada style rokugo stood looking at her with wonder and admiration a minute's reflection showed him that it could be no girl and that her beauty had almost made him forget that he was a samurai no it is no real woman it is a ghost what an opportunity for me to distinguish myself before all my friends saying which he drew his sword tempered by the famous morie shinkai and with one downward cut severed head body and all into halves he ran seized the candle and took it back to the room where the pupils were awaiting him there he told the story and begged them to come and see the ghost all the young men looked at one another none of them being partial to ghosts in what you may call real life none cared to venture but by and by yamamoto jonosuke with better courage than the rest said i will go and dashed off as soon as the other pupils saw this they also gathering pluck went forth into the garden when they came to the spot where the dead ghost was supposed to lie they found only the remains of a snowman which they themselves had made during the day and this was cut in half from head to foot just as rokugo had described they all laughed several of the young samurai were angry for they thought that 
rokugo had been making fools of them but when they returned to the house they soon saw that rokugo had not been trifling they found him sitting with an air of great haughtiness and thinking that his pupils would now indeed see how able a swordsman he was however they looked at rokugo scornfully and addressed him thus indeed we have received remarkable evidence of your ability even the small boy who throws a stone at a dog would have had the courage to do what you did rokugo became angry and called them insolent he lost his temper to such an extent that for a moment his hand flew to his sword hilt and he even threatened to kill one or two of them the samurai apologized for their rudeness but added your ghost was only the snowman we made ourselves this morning that is why we tell you that a child need not fear to attack it at this information rokugo was confounded and he in his turn apologized for his temper nevertheless he said he could not understand how it was possible for him to mistake a snowman for a female ghost puzzled and ashamed he begged his friends not to say any more about the matter but keep it to themselves thereupon he bade them farewell and left the house it was no longer snowing but the snow lay thick upon the ground rokugo had had a good deal of sake and his gait was not over steady as he made his way home to warigesui when he passed near the gates of the korinji temple he noticed a woman coming faster than he could understand through the temple grounds he leaned against the fence to watch her her hair was dishevelled and she was all out of order soon a man came running behind her with a butcher's knife in his hand and shouted as he caught her you wicked woman you have been unfaithful to your poor husband and i will kill you for it for i am his friend stabbing her five or six times he did so and then moved away rokugo resuming his way homewards thought what a good friend must be the man who had killed the unfaithful wife a bad woman justly rewarded with death thought he rokugo had not gone very far however when to his utter astonishment he met face to face the woman whom he had just seen killed she was looking at him with angry eyes and she said how can a brave samurai watch so cruel a murder as you have just seen enjoying the sight rokugo was much astonished do not talk to me as if i were your husband said he for i am not i was pleased to see you killed for being unfaithful indeed if you are the ghost of the woman i shall kill you myself before he could draw his sword the ghost had vanished rokugo continued his way and on nearing his house he met a woman who came up to him with horrible face and clenched teeth as if in agony he had had enough troubles with women that evening they must be foxes who had assumed the forms of women thought he as he continued to gaze at this last one at that moment he recollected that he had heard of a fact about fox women it was that fire coming from the bodies of foxes and badgers is always so bright that even on the darkest night you can tell the color of their hair or even the figures woven in the stuffs they wear when assuming the forms of men or women it is clearly visible that one can six feet remembering this rokugo approached a little closer to the woman and sure enough he could see the pattern of her dress shown up as if fire were underneath the hair too seemed to have fire under it knowing now that it was a fox he had to do with rokugo drew his best sword the famous one made by morie and proceeded to attack carefully for he knew he should have to hit the fox and not the spirit of the fox in the woman's form it is said that whenever a fox or a badger transforms itself into human shape the real presence stands behind the apparition if the apparition appears on the left side the presence of the animal himself is on the right rokugo made his attack accordingly killing the fox and consequently the apparition he ran to his house and called up his relations who came flocking out with lanterns near a myrtle tree which was almost two hundred years old they found the body not of fox or badger but of an otter the animal was carried home next day invitations were issued to all the pupils at the fencing school to come and see it and a great feast was given rokugo had wiped away a great disgrace the pupils erected a tomb for the beast it is known as yukidzuka the snow tomb and is still to be seen in the korinji temple at warigesui honjo in tokyo end of chapter fifty recording by maria melodia Carey. Chapter 51 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David McKay. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. The Dragon Shaped Plum Tree. In the year 1716 of the Kyoho era, 191 years ago, there lived at Momoyama Fushimi an old gardener, Hambei, who was loved and respected for his kindliness of nature and his great honesty. Though a poor man, Hambei had saved enough to live on, and he had inherited a house and garden from his father. Consequently, he was happy. His favorite pastime was tending the garden, and an extraordinarily fine plum tree, known in Japan as of the furio kind, which means lying dragon. Such trees are of great value and much sought after for the arrangement of gardens. Curiously enough, though one may see many beautiful ones, trees growing on mountains or on wild islands, they are very rarely touched except near the larger commercial centers. Indeed, the Japanese have almost a veneration for some of these fantastic furio-shaped trees, and leave them alone whether they be pines or plums. The tree in question Hambei loved so much that no offer people could make would induce him to part with it. So notoriously beautiful were the tints and curves of this old stunted tree. Large sums had many times been offered for it. Hambei loved it not only for its beauty, but also because it had belonged to his father and grandfather. Now, in his old age, with his wife in her dotage and his children gone, it was his chief companion. In the autumn he tended it in its untidiness of dead and dying leaves. He felt sorry and sympathetic for it in its cold and bare state in November and December. But in January he was happily employed in watching the buds which would blossom in February. When they did bloom, it was his custom to let the people come at certain hours daily to see the tree and listen to stories of historical facts and also to stories of romance regarding the plum tree of which the Japanese mind is ever full. When this again was over, Hambei pruned and tied the tree. In the hot season he lingered under it smoking his pipe and was often rewarded for his care by two or three dozen delicious plums, which he valued and loved as much, almost, as if they had been his own offspring. Thus, year after year, the tree had become so much Hambei's companion that a king's ransom would not have bought it from him. Alas, no man is destined to be let alone in this world. Someone is sure sooner or later to covet his property. It came to pass that a high official at the emperor's court heard of Hambei's furio tree and wanted it for his own garden. This Dainagan sent his steward, Kotara Naruse, to see Hambei with a view to purchase, never for a moment doubting that the old gardener would readily sell if the sum offered were sufficient. Kotaro Naruse arrived at Momoyama Fushimi, and was received with due ceremony. After drinking a cup of tea, he announced that he had been sent to inspect and make arrangements to take the Furio plum tree for the Dainagan. Hambei was perplexed. What excuse for refusal should he make to so high a personage? He made a fumbling and rather stupid remark, of which the clever steward soon took advantage. On no account, said Hambei, can I sell the old tree? I have refused many offers for it already. I never said that I was sent to buy the tree for money, said Kotaro. I said that I had come to make arrangements by which the Dainagan could have it conveyed carefully to his palace, where he proposes to welcome it with ceremony and treat it with the greatest kindness. It is like taking a bride to the palace for the Dainagan. Oh, what an honor for the plum tree to be united by marriage with one of such illustrious lineage! You should indeed be proud of such a union for your tree. Please, be counseled by me and grant the Dainagon's wish. What was Hambei now to say? Such a lowly-born person asked by a gallant samurai to grant a favor to no less a person than the Dainagon. Sir, he answered, your request in behalf of the Dainagon has been so courteously made that I am completely prevented from refusing. You must, however, tell the Dainagon that the tree is a present, for I cannot sell it. Kotaro was greatly pleased with the success of his maneuvers, and, drawing from his clothes a bag, said, 
please, as is customary on making a gift, except this small one in return. To the gardener's great astonishment, the bag contained gold. He returned it to Kotaro, saying it was impossible to accept the gift. But on again being pressed by the smooth-tongued samurai, he retracted. The moment Kotaro had left, Hambei regretted this. He felt as if he had sold his own flesh and blood, as if he had sold his daughter to the Dainagon. That evening he could not sleep. Towards midnight his wife rushed into his room, and, pulling him by the sleeve, shouted, "'You wicked old man! You villainous old rascal! At your age, too! Where did you get that girl? I have caught you! Don't tell me lies! You are going to beat me now, I see by your eyes. I am not surprised if you avenge yourself in this way. You must feel an old fool!' Hambai thought his wife had gone off her head for good this time. He had seen no girl. "'What is the matter with you, Obasan?' he asked. "'I have seen no girl, and do not know what you are talking about.' "'Don't tell me lies. I saw her. I saw her myself when I went down to get a cup of water.' "'Saw... saw... what, what do you mean?' said Hambai. "'I think you've gone mad talking of seeing girls. I did see her. I saw her weeping outside the door.' and a beautiful girl she was you old sinner only seventeen or eighteen years of age Ambe got out of bed to see for himself whether his wife had spoken the truth or had gone truly mad on reaching the door he heard sobbing and on opening beheld a beautiful girl who are you and why here asked Hambe. i am the spirit of the plum tree which for so many years you have tended and loved, as did your father before you. I have heard, and grieve greatly at it, that an arrangement has been made whereby I am to be removed to the Dainagon's gardens. It may seem good fortune to belong to a noble family, and an honor to be taken into it. I cannot complain, yet I grieve at being moved from where I have been so long, and from you, who have so carefully tended to my wants. Can you not let me remain here a little longer, as long as I live. I pray you, do. I have made a promise to send you off on Saturday to the Dainagon in Kyoto, but I cannot refuse your plea, for I love to have you here. Be easy in your mind, and I will see what can be done, said Hambei. The spirit dried its tears, smiled at Hambei, and disappeared, as it were, into the stem of the tree while Hambei's wife stood looking on in wonder, not at all reassured that there was not some trick on her husband's part. At last, the fatal Saturday on which the tree was to be removed arrived, and Kotaro came with many men and a cart. Hambei told him what had happened, of the tree's spirit, and of what it had implored of him. "'Here, take the money, please,' said the old man. Tell the story to the Dainagon as I tell it to you, and surely he will have mercy. Kotaro was angry and said, How has this change come about? Have you been drinking too much sake, or are you trying to fool me? You must be careful, I warn you, else you shall find yourself headless. Even supposing the spirit of the tree did appear to you in the form of a girl, did it say that it would be sorry to leave your poor garden for a place of honor in that of the Dainagon? You are a fool and an insulting fool. How dare you return the Dainagon's present? How could I explain such an insult to him, and what would he think of me? As you are not keeping your word, I will take the tree by force, or kill you in place of it. Kotaro was greatly enraged. He kicked Hambei down the steps, and, drawing his sword, was about to cut off his head, when suddenly there was a little puff of wind, scented with plum blossom, and then there stood in front of Kotaro the beautiful girl, the spirit of the plum tree. "'Get out of my way, or you'll get hurt!' shouted Kotaro. "'No, I will not go away. You had better kill me, the spirit that has brought such trouble, instead of killing a poor innocent old man,' said the spirit. "'I don't believe in the spirits of plum trees,' said Kotaro. "'That you are a spirit is evident, but you are only that of an old fox, so I will comply with your request.' and at all events kill you first. No sooner had he said this than he made a cut with his sword, 
and he distinctly felt that he cut through a body. The girl disappeared, and all that fell was a branch of the plum tree and most of the flowers that were blooming. Kotaro now realized that what the gardener had told him was true, and made apologies accordingly. I will carry this branch to the Dainagon, said he, and see if he will listen to the story. Thus was Hambei's life saved by the spirit of the tree. The Dainagon heard the story, and was so moved that he sent the old gardener a kind message, and told him to keep the tree and the money, as an expression of his sorrow for the trouble which he had brought about. Alas, however, the tree withered and died soon after Kotaro's cruel blow, and in spite of Hambei's care. The dead stump was venerated for many years. End of chapter 51 Recording by David McKay Chapter 52 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David McKay Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith The Chessboard Cherry Tree Begin Note This story, with the exception of the ghost, I believe to be true, for the seppuku of Saito Ukan is just the kind of reasoning that would have been held out in the days of the story, and is even today possible in many cases. See a case quoted by Professor Chamberlain of the servant to an Englishman at Yokohama, and note the number of cases in the recent war. End note. In olden times, long before the misfortunes of Europeanization came to Japan, there lived at Kazamatsu, in Nakasatani, near Shijikwai Mura Shinjigun, Hitachi province, a hot-headed old daimyo, Oda Saemon. His castle stood at the top of a pine-clad hill about three miles from what is now known as Kamitachi Station on the Nippon Railway. Saemon was noted for his bravery as a soldier, for his abominable play at Go, or Goban, and for his bad temper and violence when he lost, which was invariably. His most intimate friends among his retainers had tried hard to reform his manners after losing at Go, but it was hopeless. All those who won from him he struck in the face with a heavy iron fan, such as was carried by warriors in those days and he would just as readily have drawn his sword and cut his best friend's head off, as been interfered with on those occasions. To be invited to play go with their lord was what all his bold samurai dreaded most. At last it was agreed among them that sooner than suffer the gross indignity of being struck by him when they won, they would let him win. After all, it did not much matter there being no money on the game. Thus Sayamon's game grew worse and worse, for he never learned anything. Yet in his conceit, he thought he was better than everybody. On the 3rd of March, in honor of his little daughter, Ochio, he gave a dinner party to his retainers. The 3rd of March is the doll's day, Hina no Sekku, the day upon which girls bring out their dolls. People go from house to house to see them, and the little owners offer you sweet white sake in a doll's cup, with much ceremony. Sayamon, no doubt, chose this day of feasting as a compliment to his daughter, for he gave sweet white sake after their food, to be drunk to the health of the dolls, instead of men's sake, which the guests would have liked much better. Sayamon himself absolutely disliked sweet sake. So as soon as the feast was over, he called Saito Ukon, one of his oldest and most faithful warriors, to come and play go with him, leaving the others to drink. Ukon, curiously enough, had not played with his lord before, and he was delighted that he had been chosen. He had made up his mind to die that evening, after giving his master a proper lesson. In a luxuriously decorated room there was placed a goban, chessboard, with two go cases containing the men, which are made of white and black stones. The white stones are usually taken by the superior player and the black by the inferior. Without any apology or explanation, Ukon took the case containing the white stones and began to place them as if he were, without question, the superior player. Sayamon's temper began to work up, but he did not show it. So many games of go had his retainers allowed him to win lately, he was fully confident that he should win again. 
and that Ukon would have in addition to apologize for presuming to take the white stones. The game ended in a win for Ukon. I must have another game, said Sayamon. I was careless in that one. I will soon show you how I can beat you when I try. Again Sayamon was beaten this time not without losing his temper, for his face turned red, his eyes looked devilish, and with a bullying voice full of passion he roared for a third game. This also, Ukon won. Sayamon's wrath knew no bounds. Seizing his iron fan, he was about to smite Ukon a violent blow in the face. His opponent caught him by the wrist and said, My lord, what ideas have you about games? Your lordship seems to think curiously about them. It is the better player who wins, while the inferior must fail. If you fail to beat me at go, it is because you are the inferior player. Is this manner of your lordships in taking defeat from a superior up to the form of Bushido in a samurai as we are taught it? Be counseled by me, your faithful retainer, and be not so hasty with your anger. It ill befits one in your lordship's high position. And with a look full of reproof at Sayamon, Ukon bowed almost to the ground. "'You insolent rascal!' roared Sayamon. "'How dare you speak to me like that! "'Don't move. "'Stand as you are with your head bowed, so that I may take it off.' "'Your sword is to kill your enemies, not your retainers and friends,' said Ukon. "'Sheath your sword, my lord. "'You need not trouble yourself to kill me, for I have already done seppuku, "'disemboweled myself, in order to offer you the advice which I have given, "'and to save all others. "'See here, my lord!' Ukon opened his clothes and exhibited an immense cut across his stomach. Sayamon stood for a minute, taken aback, and while he thus stood, Ukon spoke to him once more, telling him how he must control his temper and treat his subjects better. On hearing this advice again, Sayamon's passion returned. Seizing his sword, he rushed upon Ukon, and crying, "'Not even by your dying spirit will I allow myself to be advised!' made a furious cut at Ukon's head. He missed, and cut the go-board in two instead. Then, seeing that Ukon was dying rapidly, Sayamon dropped beside him, crying bitterly, and saying, Much do I regret to see you thus die, O faithful Ukon. In losing you I lose my oldest and most faithful retainer. You have served me faithfully, and fought most gallantly in all my battles. Pardon me, I beg of you. I will take your advice. It was surely a sign by the gods that they were displeased at my conduct when they made me miss your head with my sword and cut the go-board. Ukon was pleased to find his lord at last repentant. He said, I shall not even in death forget the relation between master and servant, and my spirit shall be with you and watch over your welfare as long as you live. Then Ukon breathed his last. Sayamon was so much moved by the faithfulness of Ukon that he caused him to be buried in his own garden, and he buried the broken go-board with him. From that time on, the Lord Sayamon's conduct was completely reformed. He was good and kind to all his subjects, and all his people were happy. A few months after Ukon's death, a cherry tree sprang out of his grave. In three years, the tree grew to be a fine one and bloomed luxuriantly. On the 3rd of March in the 3rd year, the anniversary of Ukon's death, Sayamon was surprised to find it suddenly in bloom. He was looking at it, and thinking of watering it himself, as usual on that day, when he suddenly saw a faint figure standing by the stem of the tree. Just as he said, You are, I know, the spirit of faithful Saito Ukon. The figure disappeared. Sayamon ran to the tree to pour water over the roots, when he noticed that the bark of some feet of the stem had all cracked up to the size and shape of the squares of a go-board. He was much impressed. For years afterwards, until, in fact, Sayamon's death, the ghost of Ukon appeared on each third of March. A fence was built round the tree, which was held sacred, and even to the present, they say, the tree is to be seen. End of chapter 52 Recording by David McKay
Chapter Fifty Three of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. The Precious Sword, Natori no Hoto. Edi Kamomotsu was a vassal of the lord of Nakura town in Kishu. His ancestors had all been brave warriors, and he had greatly distinguished himself in a battle at Shizu Gataki, which took its name from a mountain in the province of Omi. The great Hideyoshi had successfully fought in the same place so far back as in the eleventh year of the Tensho era, fifteen seventy three to fifteen ninety two, that is, fifteen eighty four, with Shiba Katsui. Iri Kamotsu ancestors were loyal men. One of them, as a warrior, had a reputation second to none. He had cut the heads off no fewer than forty eight men with one sword. In due time, this weapon came to Iri Kamotsu and was kept by him as a most valuable family treasure rather early in life kamotsu found himself a widower his young wife left a son called fujiwaka by and by kamotsu felt lonely married a lady whose name was sadako sadako later bore a son who was called goro twelve or fourteen years after that Kamamotsu himself died, leaving the two sons in charge of Sadako. Fujiwaka was at that time nineteen years of age. Sadako became jealous of Fujiwaka, knowing him as the elder son to be the heir to Kamamotsu's property she tried by every means to put her own son gora first in the meantime a little romance was secretly going on between a beautiful girl called sei daughter of iwasa shiro and young fujiwaka they had fallen in love with each other were holding secret meetings to their heart's content and vowing promises of marriage at last they were found out and sadako made their conduct a pretext for driving fujiwaka out of the house and depriving him of all rights in the family property attached to the establishment was a faithful old nurse matsui who had brought up fujiwaka from his infancy she was grieved at the injustice which had been done but little did she think of the loss of money or of property in comparison with the loss of the sword the miraculous sword of which the outcast son was the proper owner she thought night and day of how she might get the heirloom for young fujiwaka after many days she came to the conclusion that she must steal the sword from the ihai shrine or rather a wooden tablet in the interior of the shrine bearing the posthumous name of an ancestor which represents the spirit of that ancestor one day when her mistress and the others were absent matsui stole the sword no sooner had she done so than it became apparent that it would be some months perhaps before she should be able to put it into the hands of the rightful owner 
for of fujiwaka nothing had been heard since his stepmother had driven him out fearing that she might be accused the faithful matsui dug a hole in the garden near the ayuma a little house such as is kept in every japanese gentleman's garden for performing the tea ceremony in and there she put the sword meaning to keep it hidden until such time as she should be able to present it to fujiwaka sadako having occasion to go to the budsudan the day after missed the sword and knowing omatsu to have been the only servant left in the house at the time taxed her with the theft of the sword matsu denied the theft thinking that in the cause of justice it was right of her to do so but it was not easy to persuade sadaku who had matsui confined in an outhouse and gave orders that neither rice nor water was to be given her until she confessed no one was allowed to go near matsu except sadako herself who kept the key of the shed which she visited only once every four or five days about the tenth day poor matsu died from starvation she had stuck faithfully to her resolution that she would keep the sword and deliver it some day to her young master the lawful heir no one knew of matsui's death the evening on which she had died found sadako seated in an old shed in a remote part of the garden and trying to cool herself for it was very hot after she had sat for about half an hour she suddenly saw the figure of an emaciated woman with dishevelled hair the figure appeared from behind a stone lantern glided along towards the place where sadako was seated and looked full into sadako's face sadako immediately recognized masui and upbraided her loudly for breaking out of her prison go back you thieving woman said she i have not half finished with you yet how dare you leave the place where you were locked up and come to confront me the figure gave no answer but glided slowly along to the spot where the sword had been buried and dug it up sadako watched carefully and being no coward rushed at the figure of matsui intending to seize the sword figure and sword suddenly disappeared sadako then ran at top speed to the shed where matsui had been imprisoned and flung the door open with violence before her lay matsui dead evidently having been so for two or three days her body was thin and emaciated sadako perceived that it must have been the ghost of omatsui that she had seen and mumbled namu amida butsu namu amida butsu the buddhist prayer asking for protection or mercy after having been driven from his family home Idi fujiwaka had wandered to many places begging his food at last he got some small employment and was able to support himself at a very cheap inn at umamachi asakusa temple one midnight he awoke and found standing at the foot of his bed the emaciated figure of his old nurse bearing in her hands the precious sword the heirloom valued beyond all others it was wrapped in scarlet and gold brocade as it had been before and it was laid reverentially by the figure of omatsu at fujiwaka's feet 
oh my dear nurse said he how glad am i before he had closed his sentence the figure had disappeared my storyteller did not say what became of sadoko or of her son end of chapter fifty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter fifty four of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith chapter fifty four the white serpent god harada kurando was one of the leading vassals of the lord of tsurgu he was a remarkable swordsman and gave lessons in fencing next in seniority to harada among the vassals was one gunayu who also taught fencing but he was no match for the famous harada and consequently was somewhat jealous one day to encourage the art of fencing amongst his vassals the daimo summoned all his people and ordered them to give an exhibition in his presence after the younger vassals had performed the daimo gave an order that harada kurando and hira gundayu should have a match to the winner he said he would present a gold image of the goddess of kawananon both men fenced their best there was great excitement gundayu had never done so well before but harada was too good he won the match receiving the gold image of kawanon from the hands of the daimo amid loud cheering gundayu left the scene of the encounter boiling over with jealousy and vowing vengeance four of his most faithful companions left with him and said they would help him to waylay and assault harada that very evening having arranged this cowardly plan they proceeded to hide on the road which harada must traverse on his return home for three hours they lay there with evil intentions at last in the moonlight they saw harada come staggering along for as was natural on such an occasion he had with friends been indulging in sake freely gundayu and his four companions sprang out at him gundayu shouting now you will have to fight me to the death harada tried to draw his sword but was slow his head whirling gundayu did not wait but cut him to the ground killing him the five villains then hunted through his clothes found the golden image of kawanon and ran off never again to appear on the domains of the lord of sugaru when the body of harada was found there was great grief donosuke harada's son a boy of sixteen vowed to avenge his father's death and obtained from the daimo special permission to kill gundayu as and when he chose the disappearance of gundayu was sufficient evidence that he had been the murderer yonosuke set out that day on his hunt for gundayu he wandered about the country for five long years without getting the slightest clue 
but at the end of that time by the guidance of buddha he located his enemy at gifu where he was acting as fencing master to the feudal lord of that place yonosuku found that it would be difficult to get at gundao in an ordinary way for he hardly ever left the castle he decided therefore to change his name to that of ipai and to apply for a place in gundao's house as a shugen a samurai's private attendant in this ipai as we shall now call him was particularly lucky for as gundao was in want of such an attendant he got the place on the twenty fourth of june a great celebration was held at the house of gundao it being the fifth anniversary of his service to the clan he put his stolen golden image of kawanan on the tokonoma the part of a japanese room raised five inches above the floor where pictures and flowers are placed and a dinner with saki was set before it a dinner was given by gundao to his friends all of whom drank so deeply that they fell asleep next day the image of kawanan had disappeared it was not to be found a few days later ipai became ill and owing to poverty was unable to buy proper medicine he went from bad to worse his fellow servants were kind to him but they could do nothing that improved his condition ipai did not seem to care he lay in his bed and seemed almost pleased to be getting weaker and weaker all he asked was that a branch of his favorite omato rodea japonica should be kept in a vase before his bed so that he might see it continually and this simple request was naturally complied with in the autumn ipai passed quietly away and was buried after the funeral when the servants were cleaning out the room in which he had died it was noticed with astonishment that a small white snake was curled round the vase containing the omoto they tried to remove it but it coiled itself tighter at last they threw the vase into the pond not caring to have such a thing about them to their astonishment the water had no effect on the snake which continued to cling to the vase feeling that there was something uncanny about the snake they wanted to get it farther away so they cast a net brought the vase and snake to shore again and threw them into a stream even that made but little difference the snake slightly changing its position so as to keep the branch of omoto from falling out of the vase by this time there was consternation among the servants and the news spread to the different houses within the castle gates some samurai came down to the stream to see and found the white snake still firmly coiled about the vase and branch one of the samurai drew his sword and made a slash at the snake which let go and escaped but the vase was broken and to the alarm of all the image of the kawanon fell out into the stream together with a stamped permit from the feudal lord of sugaru to kill a certain man whose name was left blank the samurai who had broken the vase and found the lost treasure seemed particularly pleased and hastened to tell gundau the good news but instead of being pleased that person showed signs of fear he became deadly pale when he heard the story of the death of ipai 
and of the extraordinary appearance of the mysterious white snake he trembled he realized that ipai was no less a person than yonosuke son of harada whose appearance after the murder he had always feared true to the spirit of a samurai however gundayu pulled himself together and professed great pleasure to the person who had brought the image of kawanon moreover to celebrate the occasion he gave a great feast that evening curiously enough the samurai who had broken the vase and recovered the image became suddenly ill and was unable to attend after he had dismissed his guests at about ten p m gundau retired to his bed in the middle of the night he awoke with what he took to be a terrible nightmare there was a choking sensation at his throat he squirmed and twisted gurgling noises proceeded from his mouth to such an extent that he aroused his wife who in terror struck a light she saw a white snake coiled tightly round her husband's throat his face was purple and his eyeballs stood out two inches from his face she called for help but it was too late as the young samurai came rushing in their fencing master was black in the face and dead next day there was a close investigation messengers were dispatched to the lord of tsugu to inquire as to the history of the murdered harada kurando father of yonosuke or ipai and as to that of gundayu who had been in his employ for five years having ascertained the truth the lord of gifu moved by the zeal of yonosuke in discharging his filial duties returned the golden image of kawanon to the bereaved family of harada and in commemoration he worshipped the dead snake at a shrine erected at the foot of kodoyama mountain the spirit is still known as hajuka no myojin the white serpent god end of chapter 54 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 55 of the ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith A Festival of the Awabi Fish Manazuru minato is situated on a small promontory of the same name it faces the sagma bay framed for beauty at its back are mountains rising gradually and overtopped in the distance by the majestic fuji to the north on clear days the sandy shores of kozu and oiso twenty-five miles off seem to be almost within arm's reach some people have compared the beauties of manazuru zaki from cape to river with the place in china called sikihiki by the celebrated poet of the country sotoba who wrote sikihiki no fu the ode to sikihiki many years ago minamoto no yoritomo after his defeat at the battle of ishibashiyama fled to manazuru minato 
and stayed there for a few days while waiting for favorable weather to cross to the opposite side the province of awa one can still see i am told the cave in which he hid which retains its old name shito iwa the scenery on the coast is magnificent the rocks rise sheer out of the sea and enclose a perfect little bay on the inside of manazu zaki cape there the fishermen erected a quiet little shrine kibuni jinja where they worship the goddess who guards the fishing of their coast they had but little to complain of in the bay of manzuru the waters were deep and always well stocked with fish such as tai in due season came the sawara giant mackerel and all the smaller migratory fishes including the sardine and anchovy the fishermen had not to complain of until about forty years ago when a strange thing happened on the twenty fourth of june a person from some inland place arrived for a few days sea bathing he was no swimmer and he was drowned the first day his body was never recovered though the fishermen did all they could to find it from this event onwards for a full two years the abundance of fish in the bay grew less and less until it became difficult to catch enough to eat the situation was serious in the extreme some of the elder fishermen attributed the change to the stranger who had been drowned it is our unrecovered body they said that has made our sacred waters change the uncleanliness has offended gugun ohimi our goddess it will never do to go on as we are we must hold a special festival at the temple of kibuni jinja accordingly the head priest iwata was approached he was pleased with the idea and a certain day was fixed upon on the appointed evening hundreds of fishermen gathered together with torches in one hand and shiarau or gohi papers footnote gohi papers are a shinto emblem representing gifts of cloth to the deity usually the god kami some say gohi represent in their curious cutting the kami beating dora a gong used in worship End footnote. fastened on a bamboo in the other they formed into procession and advanced towards the shrine from various directions beating gongs at the temple the priests read from the sacred books and prayed to the goddess that had watched over them and their fisheries not to desert them because their waters had been polluted by a dead body they would search for it by every means in their power and cleanse the bay suddenly while the priest was praying a light the brilliance of which nearly blinded the fishermen flashed out of the water the priest stopped for a moment a rumbling noise was heard at the bottom of the sea and then there arose to the surface a goddess of surpassing beauty probably kawanon gioran she looked at the ceremony which was being held on shore for a full hour and then disappeared with another flash leaving the sound of roaring waves the priest and the elder fishermen considered matters and came to the conclusion that what they had seen was indeed their goddess and that she had been pleased at their ceremony also they thought the dead body must still be at the bottom of the bay directly under the spot whence the flashes of light and the goddess herself had appeared 
it was arranged that two young virgins who could dive should be sent down at the spot to see and two were accordingly chosen sayotom and tamajo wrapped in white skirts these maidens were taken in a boat to where the flashes and the goddess had appeared the girls dived reached the bottom and searched for the body of the man drowned two years before instead of finding it they saw only a small but dazzling light curiosity led them to the spot and there they found hundreds upon hundreds of awabi ear shells fastened upon a rock six feet in height and twenty-five or thirty in length whenever the fish moved they were obliged to raise their shells and it was the glitter of the pearls inside that had attracted the damsels this rock must have been the tomb of the drowned or else the home of the goddess sayotom and tamajo returned to the surface each having taken from the rock a large shell to show the priest as they came to the shore cheers were given in their honor and the priest and the fishermen crowded round them on learning about the awabi shells which they had never before heard of as being in the bay they came to the conclusion that it was not uncleanliness that kept the fish away the lights thrown from the brilliant nacreous shells and pearls inside them must be the cause many times have we heard of the awabi flying they must have flown here at some time within two years the fishermen resolved to remove them it was evident that the goddess had appeared in the light so as to show what it was that kept the fish away no time was lost many hundreds of men and women went down and cleared the place and the fish began to return to manazuro minato at the suggestion of the priest iwata there is held on every twenty fourth of june a matsuri festival the fishermen light torches and go to the shrine for worship all the night through this is called the awabi festival of kabuni note this story was told to me by a man who knows nothing of shellfish he told the story as of the osari a kind of cockle shell dug out of the sand at low tide it is impossible that the story could have referred to other shellfish than haliotis the ear shell or the awabi or the regular pearl oyster diving women have seen the flight of haliotis and described it to me if one feels disposed to leave a rock they all feel the same impulse and go thus it is the large old heliotis sometimes appear on a rock some fifteen fathoms deep when not one was there the day before and they go with equal quickness for a thousand years or more the same rocks have been haunted and divers keep their finds at the bottom of the sea a great secret at least so i observe at toshi end of chapter fifty five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number fifty six of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. 
the spirit of a willow tree saves family honor long ago there lived in yamada village sarashina gun shinanto province one of the richest men in the northern part of japan for many generations the family had been rich and at last the fortune descended in the eighty-third generation to gobi yusa the family had no title but the people treated them almost with the respect due to a princely house even the boys in the street who are not given to bestowing either compliments or titles of respect bowed ceremoniously when they met gobi yusa gobi was the soul of good nature sympathetic to all in trouble the riches which gobi had inherited were mainly money and land about which he worried himself very little it would have been difficult to find a man who knew less and cared less about his affairs than gobi he spent his money freely and when he came to think of accounts his easy nature let them all slide his great pleasures were painting kakimono pictures talking to his friends and eating good things he ordered his steward not to worry him with unsatisfactory accounts of crops or any other disagreeable subjects the destiny of man and his fate is arranged in heaven said he gobi was quite celebrated as a painter and could have made a considerable amount of money by selling his kakimonos but no that would not be doing credit to his ancestors and his name one day while things were going from bad to worse and gobi was seated in his room painting a friend came to gossip he told gobi that the village people were beginning to talk seriously about a spirit that had been seen by no fewer than three of them at first they had laughed at the man who saw the ghost the second man who saw it they were inclined not to take quite seriously but now it had been seen by one of the village elders and so there could be no doubt about it where do they see it asked gobi they say that it appears under your old willow tree between eleven and twelve o'clock at night the tree that hangs some of its boughs out of your garden into the street that is odd remarked gobi i can remember hearing of no murder under that tree nor even spirit connection with any of my ancestors but there must be something if three of our villagers have seen it yet again where there is an old willow tree some one is sure to say sooner or later that he has seen a ghost if there is a spirit there i wonder whose it is i should like to paint the ghost if i could see it so as to leave it to my descendants as the last ominous sign on the road which has led to the family's ruin that i shall make an effort to do this very evening i will sit up to watch for the thing never had gobi been seized with such energy before he dismissed his friend and went to bed at four o'clock in the afternoon so as to allow himself to be up at ten o'clock that hour his servant awoke him but even then he could not be got up before eleven by twelve o'clock midnight gobi was at last out in his garden hidden in bushes facing the willow it was a bright night and there was no sign of any ghost until after one o'clock 
when clouds passed over the moon just when gobi was thinking of going back to bed he beheld arising from the ground under the willow a thin column of white smoke which gradually assumed the form of a charming girl gobi stared in astonishment and admiration he had never thought that a ghost could be such a vision of beauty rather he had expected to see a white wild-eyed disheveled old woman with protruding bones the spectacle of whom would freeze his marrow and make his teeth clatter gradually the beautiful figure approached gobi and hung its head as if it wished to address him who and what are you cried gobi you seem too beautiful to my mind to be the spirit of one who is dead if you are indeed spectral do tell me if you may whose spirit are you and why you appear under this willow tree i am not the spirit or ghost of man as you say answered the spirit but the spirit of this willow tree then why do you leave the tree now as they tell me you have done several times within the last ten days i am as i say the spirit of this willow which was planted here in the twenty-first generation of your family that is now about six centuries ago i was planted to mark the place where your wise ancestor buried a treasure twenty feet below the ground and fifteen from my stem facing east there is a vast sum of gold in a strong iron chest hidden there the money was buried to save your house when it was about to fall never hitherto has there been danger but now in your time ruin has come and it is for me to step forth and tell you how by the foresight of your ancestor you have been saved from disgracing the family name by bankruptcy pray dig the strong box up and save the name of your house begin as soon as you can and be careful in future then she vanished gobi returned to the house scarcely believing it possible that such good luck had come to him as the spirit of the willow tree planted by his wise ancestor had said he did not go to bed however he summoned a few of his most faithful servants and at daybreak began digging what excitement there was when at nineteen feet they struck the top of an iron chest gobi jumped with delight and it may almost be said that his servants did the same for to see their honored master's name fall into the disgrace of bankruptcy would have caused many of them to disembowel themselves they tore and dug with all their might until they had the huge and weighty case out of the hole they broke off the top with pickaxes and then gobi saw a collection of old sacks he seized one of these but the age of it was too great it burst and sent rolling out over a hundred immense old-fashioned oblong gold coins of ancient times which must have been worth thirty pounds each gobi yusa's hand shook he could hardly realize as true as good fortune which had come to him bag after bag was pulled out each containing a small fortune until finally the bottom of the box was reached here was found a letter some six hundred years of age saying he of my descendants who was obliged to make use of the treasure 
to save our family reputation will read aloud and make known that this treasure has been buried by me fuji yusa in the twenty-first generation of our family so that in time of need or danger a future generation will be able to fall back upon it and save the family name he whose great misfortune necessitates the use of the treasure must say greatly do i repent the folly that has brought the affairs of our family so low and necessitated the assistance of an early ancestor i can only repay such by diligent attention to my household affairs and also show high appreciation and give kindness to the willow tree which has so long been watching and guarding my ancestor's treasure these things i vow to do i shall reform entirely gobi yusa read this out to the servants and to his friends he became a man of energy his lands and farms were properly taken care of and the yusa family regained its influential position gobi painted a kakimono of the spirit of the willow tree as he had seen her and this he kept in his own room during the rest of his life it is the famous painting in the yusa gardens today which is called the willow ghost and perhaps it is the model from which most of the willow tree ghost paintings have sprung gobi fenced in the famous willow tree and attended to it himself as did those who followed him end of chapter 56 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter 57 of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david mckay ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith the camphor tree tomb five ri ten miles from shirakawa in the province of iwaki there is a village called yabukimura close by is a grove some four hundred feet square the trees used to include a monster camphor nearly one hundred and fifty feet in height of untold age and venerated by villagers and strangers alike as one of the greatest trees in japan a shrine was erected to it in the grove which was known as the nekoma myojin forest and a faithful old man hamada tsushima lived there caring for the tree the shrine and the whole grove one day the tree was felled but instead of withering or dying it continued to grow and it is still flourishing though lying on the ground poor hamada tsushima disemboweled himself when the sacred tree had been cut down perhaps it is because his spirit entered the sacred tree that the tree will not die here is the story on the seventeenth of january in the third and last year of the meireki period that is sixteen fifty eight a great fire broke out in the homyoji temple in the maruyama hongo district of yedo now tokyo the fire spread with such rapidity that not only was that particular district burned but also a full eighth of yedo itself was destroyed many of the daimyo's houses and palaces were consumed the lord date tsunamune of sendai one of the three greatest daimyo's who were satsuma kaga sendai had the whole of his seven palaces and houses destroyed by the fire the other daimyo's or feudal lords lost only one or two lord date tsunamune resolved to build the finest palace that could be designed. It was to be at Shinzenza, in Shiba. He ordered that no time should be lost, and directed one of his high officials, Harada Kai Naonori, to see to the matter. Harada, accordingly, sent for the greatest house-building contractor of the day, one Kinokuniya Bunzaeman, and to him he said, 
You are aware that the fire has destroyed the whole of the town mansions of Lord Date Tsunamune. I am directed to see that the finest palace should be immediately built, second to none except the shogun's. I have sent for you as the largest contractor in Yedo. What can you do? Just make some suggestions and give me your opinion. Certainly, my lord, I can make plenty of suggestions. But to build such a palace will cost an enormous amount of money, especially now after this fire, for there is a great scarcity of large timber in the land. Never mind expenses, said Harada. Those I shall pay as you like and when you like. I will even advance money if you want it. Oh, then, answered the delighted contractor, I will start immediately. What would you think of having a palace like that of Kinkakuji in Kyoto, which was built by the shogun Ashikaga? What I should build would be a finer mansion than that of the present shogun, let alone those of any daimyo. The whole of the hagi, shelves, to be made out of the rarest woods, the tokubashira, kakumono corner post, to be of the nanten, and ceilings of unjointed camphor tree boards, should we be able to find a tree of sufficient size. I can find nearly everything except the last in my own stocks. The camphor trees are difficult. There are but few. They are mostly sacred, and dangerous to interfere with or obtain. I know of one in the forest of Neko Mamiojin in Iwaki province. If I can get that tree, I should indeed be able to make an unjointed ceiling, and that would completely put other palaces and mansions in the second rank. Well, well, I must leave all this to you, said Harada. You know that no expense need be spared, as long as you produce speedily what is required by Lord Date Tsunamune. The contractor bowed low, saying that he should set to and do his best, and he left no doubt delighted at so open a contract, which would enable him to fill his pockets. He set about making inquiries in every direction, and became convinced that the only camphor tree that would suit his purpose was the one before referred to, owing chiefly to its great breadth. Kinokuniya knew also that the part of the district wherein lay this tree belonged to or was under the management of Fujieda Geki, now in the Hanjo district of Yedo, acting as a shogun's retainer, well off, receiving 1,200 koku of rice a year, but not over-scrupulous about money, of which he was always in need. Contractor Kinokuniya soon learned all about the man, and then went to call. "'Your name is Kinokuniya Bunzaeman, I believe. What, may I ask, do you wish to see me about?' said Fujieda. "'Sir,' said the contractor, bowing low, "'it is as you say.' My name is Kinokuniya Bunzaemon, and I am a wood contractor, of whom perhaps your lordship has heard, for I have built and supplied the wood for many mansions and palaces. I come here craving assistance in the way of permission to cut trees in a small forest called Nekomamiojin, near the village called Yabukimura in the Sendai district. The contractor did not tell Fujieda Geki, the shogun's retainer or agent, that he was to build a mansion for the Daimyo Date Tsunamune and that the wood which he wanted to cut was within that daimyo's domains. For he knew full well that the Lord Date would never give him permission to cut a holy tree. It was an excellent idea to take the daimyo's trees by the help of the shogun's agent, and charge for them fully afterwards. So he continued, I can assure you, sir, this recent fire has cleared the whole market of wood. If you will assist me to get what I want, I will build you a new house for nothing. And by way of showing my appreciation, I ask you to accept this small gift of yen 200, which is only a little beginning. You need not trouble with these small details, said the delighted agent, pocketing the money. But do as you wish. I will send for the four local managers and headmen of the district wherein you wish to cut the trees. And I will let you know when they arrive in Yedo. With them you will be able to settle the matter. The interview was over. The contractor was on the high road, he felt, to getting the trees he required, and the money-wanting agent was equally well pleased that so slight an effort on his part should have been the means of enriching him by yen two hundred, with the promise of more, and a new house. About ten days later, four men, the heads of villages, arrived in Yedo and presented themselves to Fujieda, who sent for the timber contractor, telling the four, whose names were Mosuke, Magozaemon, Yohei, and Jinyemon, that he was pleased to see them, and to note how loyal they had been in their attendance on the shogun, for that he, the shogun, had had his palace burned down in the recent fire, and desired to have one immediately built, the great and only difficulty being the timber. 
I am told by our great contractor, to whom I shall introduce you presently, that the only timber fit for rebuilding the shogun's palace lies in your district. I myself know nothing about these details, and I shall leave you gentlemen to settle these matters with Kinokuniya, the contractor, so soon as he arrives. I have sent for him. In the meantime, consider yourselves welcome, and please accept of the meal I have arranged in the next room for you. Come along, and let us enjoy it. Fujieda led the four countrymen into the next room, and ate with them at the meal, during which time Kinokuniya, the contractor, arrived, and was promptly ushered into their presence. The meal was nearly at an end. Fujieda introduced the contractor, who in his turn said, Gentlemen, we cannot discuss these matters here in the house of Lord Fujieda, the shogun's agent. Now that we know one another, let me invite you to supper. At that I can explain to you exactly what I want, in the way of trees out of your district. Of course, you know my family are subjects of your feudal lords, and that we are therefore all the same. The four countrymen were delighted at so much hospitality. Two meals in an evening was an extraordinary dissipation for them, and that in Yedo. My word, what would they not be able to tell their wives on their return to their villages? Kinokuniya led the four countrymen off to a restaurant called Campanaro in Rio Goku, where he treated them with the greatest hospitality. After the meal, he said, Gentlemen, I hope you will allow me to hew timber from the forest in your village, for it is impossible for me otherwise to attempt any further building on a large scale. Very well, you may hew, said Mosuke, who was the senior of the four, since the cutting of the trees in Nekoma Myojin forest is, as it were, a necessity for our lord, they must be cut. It is, in fact, I take it an order from our lord that the trees shall be cut. But I must remind you that there is one tree in the grove which cannot be cut amid any circumstances whatever, and that is an enormous and sacred camphor tree which is very much revered in our district, and to which a shrine is erected. That tree we cannot consent to have cut. Very well, said the contractor. Just write me a little permit, giving me permission to cut any trees except the big camphor, and our business will be finished. Kinokuniya had by this time in the evening taken his measure of the countrymen, so shrewdly as to know that they were probably unable to write. <laughs> Certainly, said Mosuke. Just you write out a little agreement, Jinyeman. No, I'd rather you wrote it, Mago said Jinyaman. And I should like Yohai to write it, said Mago. But I can't write at all, said Yohai, turning to Jinyaman again. Well, never mind, never mind, said Kinokuniya. Will you gentlemen sign the document if I write it? Why, of course, they all assented. That was the best way of all. They would put their stamps to the document. This they did, and after a lively evening, departed, pleased with themselves generally. Kinokuniya, on the other hand, went home fully contented with his evening's business. Had he not, in his pocket, the permit to cut the trees, and had he not written it himself so as to suit his own purpose, he chuckled at the thought of how neatly he had managed the business. Next morning, Kinokuniya sent off his foreman, Chogoro, accompanied by ten or a dozen men. It took them three days to reach the village called Yabukimura, near the Nekomamiojin Grove, they arrived on the morning of the fourth day, and proceeded to erect a scaffold round the camphor tree, so that they might the better use their axes. As they began chopping off the lower branches, Hamada Tsushima, the keeper of the shrine, came running to them. Here, here! What are you doing? Cutting down the sacred camphor! Curse you! Stop, I tell you! Do you hear me? Stop at once! Chogoro answered, You need not stop my men in their work. They are doing what they have been ordered to do, and with a full right to do it. I am cutting down the tree at the order of my master, Kinokuniya, the timber contractor, who has permission to cut the tree from the four headmen sent to Yedo from this district. I know all that, said the caretaker, but your permission is to cut down any tree except the sacred camphor. Well, there you are wrong, as this letter will show you, said Chogoro. Read it yourself and the caretaker, in great dismay, read as follows. To Kinokuniya Bunzaemon, timber contractor Yedo, in hewing trees to build a new mansion for our lord, all the camphor trees must be spared except the large one said to be sacred in the Nekomamiojin grove, in witness whereof we set our names. Jinyemon, Magozaemon, Mosuke, Yohei. 
representing the local county officials. The caretaker, beside himself with grief and astonishment, sent for the four men mentioned. On their arrival, each declared that he had given permission to cut anything except the big camphor. But Chogoro said that he could not believe them, and in any case he would go by the written document. Then he ordered his men to continue their work on the big camphor. Hamada Tsushima, the caretaker, did harakiri, disemboweling himself there and then, but not before telling Chogoro that his spirit would go into the camphor tree to take care of it and to wreak vengeance on the wicked Kinokuniya. At last the efforts of the men brought the stately tree down with a crash, but then they found themselves unable to move it. Pull as they might, it would not budge. Each time they tried, the branches seemed to become alive. Faces and eyes became painful with the hits they got from them. Pluckily, they continued their efforts, but it was no use. Things got worse. Several of the men were caught and nearly crushed to death between the branches. Four had broken limbs from blows given in the same way. At this moment, a horseman rode up and shouted, My name is Matsumae Tetsunosuke. I am one of the Lord of Sendai's retainers. The board of councillors in Sendai have refused to allow this camphor tree to be touched. You have cut it, unfortunately. It must now remain where it is. Our feudal lord of Sendai, Lord Date Tsunamune, will be furious. Kinokuniya the contractor planned an evil scheme and will be duly punished, while as for the shogun's agent, Fujieda Geki, he also must be reported. You yourselves return to Yedo. We cannot blame you for obeying orders. But first, give me that forged permit signed by the four local fools, who, it is trusted, will destroy themselves. Chogoro and his men returned to Yedo. A few days later, the contractor was taken ill, and a shampooer was sent to his room. A little later, Kinokuniya was found dead. The shampooer had disappeared, though it was impossible for him to have got away without being seen. It is said that the spirit of Hamada Tsushima, the caretaker, had taken the form of the shampooer in order to kill the contractor. Chogoro became so uneasy in his mind that he returned to the camphor tree, where he spent all his savings in erecting a new shrine and putting in a caretaker. This is known as the Kusunoki Dzuka, the camphor tree tomb. The tree lies there, my storyteller tells me, at the present day. The End End of chapter 57 Recording by David McKay End of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith